Okay, I think now is a good time to start. I want to thank everybody for participating in our first ever online annual meeting of the US Asia Technology Management Center at Stanford University. I'm Richard Dasher, I direct the uh, center. And uh, after welcoming you today, uh, I'm going to give a little bit of information about the uh, strategic situation with the center, our uh, current activities. So um, today, what we're expecting is for me to give about 15 minutes of remarks. Then we're excited to have a keynote presentation by Dr. Chenyang Xu. And then we will have three visiting scholar reports, a break, uh, more visiting scholar reports, and then a discussion along with uh, Dr. Kenji Kushida about what's going on with emerging um, challenges in Japanese entrepreneurship and also in Silicon Valley, Japan relations. Uh, we'll end up with another set of visiting scholar reports about the research that our visiting scholars are doing right now. And then I'll give some closing remarks. Uh, during the meeting, feel free to ask questions using chat. And I will uh, make sure to uh, watch your chat and I will relay your question verbally to the speaker. We may have some opportunity for more extended remarks right at the end of the meeting. We'll see uh, how that goes along. But uh, first of all, I'd like to start out by introducing who we are. We are conducting research and education and also outreach at Stanford. We have been around since 1992. We started off with a big US Air Force grant and uh, our biggest change so far was in 2017, when we moved from the electrical engineering department to be part of the Center for East Asian Studies at Stanford University. And in that process, we became officially approved as an industry affiliates program. That means that we conduct all of our activities on the basis of annual member fees that uh, our member companies pay, and also special program income that we get reimbursement for giving seminars and so forth. We're looking at a systems approach to how innovation works, how it's conducted, how to manage it. We're also trying to use a systems approach to look at university industry government relationships to support entrepreneurship. And we're looking at technology trends in Japan and Asia. One of the things that we started doing really about 1997 is to do forecasting about the impact of a new technology on the structure and dynamics of an industry. Often this is going to focus on a trends analysis of a survey of dozens of startup companies in an area. It's interesting how things come full circle because uh, we first did this in 1997 and our project was on how to integrate data mining with decision analysis. And so suddenly with the advent of artificial intelligence and other new kinds of tools, uh, this is on real time. Uh, we're also doing studies into innovation management, especially how to manage open innovation across different business cultures. So just at a glance, what's happened with us over the last year, it, the biggest noticeable thing is we have had a very rapid scaling up in the size of our center. We started out with six member companies in uh, the end of the 2018 fiscal year, August 2019. And um, we had eight at the beginning of last this past year. Now we're at 21 member companies. So this is kind of Silicon Valley type scaling and we have to uh, learn how to manage our own uh, scaling up process. 
want to say we're especially happy that we've been working with Dr. Kenji Kushida on a lot of his new Japan related activities. And I know that a lot of our new member companies have been involved with his work. So we're, we'll have more about that cooper cooperation. You too? Uh, hearing a little bit of uh, background noise, please make sure that people are muted if you're not speaking. So in addition to our rapid scale up, we continue to give university courses and seminars. I have some more information on that. Of course, shifting to online from March. Uh, we're hosting visiting scholars from a number of our companies, and we've been involved in putting on a number of high profile public programs. So just so you can see who are the member companies now, uh, we're very happy to have all of these member companies. The ones designated with VS are companies that are sending us visiting scholars. The ones that are designated with RESRCH are companies that are providing additional support to uh, help us do research into areas of particular interest. So we uh, have some long-term relationships and I'm very happy that uh, we're a very sticky center. Uh, we don't have many companies that drop out. And uh, also you can see the large number of companies that have just joined in the last few months. Welcome to everybody. And we hope that you'll find this really useful. We want to make the center mutually useful for engagement between faculty and research activities at Stanford, and also practical uses of the research that are happening in industry. So in our Stanford courses, our flagship uh, seminar series is in fall quarter. These are available for university credit, and uh, the seminars are also open to the public. So we looked at the theme edge computing this past year, specifically whether we're seeing Asia and the US moving in different directions. So some of the background to that series were the uh, difficulties, the challenges that we've had uh, about the adoption of 5G networks. So we were able to get Professor Paul Raj who is emeritus from Stanford, winner of the Marconi Prize, and uh, really one of the world's top five or six experts on 5G, to give us an overview presentation about uh, 5G networks and their adoption. Uh, we had other technologies that were discussed. We also had Dr. Yoki Matsuoka, the former CTO of Nest, closed out our series this past uh, fall. Then we combined just sort of the enabling technologies with a study of use cases. We had industry panels of speakers on the topic of uh, autonomous vehicles, uh, augmented reality and virtual reality, medical data analytics, and you can still see the videos of this session and also the speaker slides at our website. Uh, please take a look at programs, public programs under our website. That's where you'll find them. We gave our regular university course, which is not available online, uh, on Japanese business culture and systems in winter quarter. But one of the sessions in that course, we did open to the public. Kimberly was kind enough to moderate a panel of speakers and Takahashi-san, Ms. Aki Takahashi, Wave Akisan was one of our, um, who is one of our visiting scholars, was on a panel about women in Japanese business. So we were very happy to be able to do some outreach as well as uh, educate Stanford students in this course area. We uh, also were involved in giving seminars and presentations to a number of other Stanford programs. I gave a half day seminar for the Stanford Center at Peking University in their enlightenment program when they visited here. I also gave a guest lecture at Electrical Engineering 380 uh, Computer Systems Colloquium on US-China technology friction. 
and uh, I give a year a presentation every year to the fellows of the Asia Pacific Research Center. So uh, we're very happy to be involved in helping other Stanford programs too. We uh, had a number of quite big events over the last year. One that we've been doing now, um, this is our 10th year currently. So this past year was the ninth year of the Japan US Innovation Awards program. I serve as the chair of the steering committee of the program, which we do in cooperation with the Japan Society of Northern California. We give out emerging leader awards and we showcase five Japanese startup companies to Silicon Valley audiences. And in one of those things that turned out to be more prescient than we thought it even at the time, um, the company that we gave the Emerging Leader U.S. Award to this year was Zoom Communications. And CEO Eric Yuan actually came and received the, uh, the award and gave a good presentation to our program. We had our biggest event in November. Along with one of our member companies, Ishin Company, we put on the Silicon Valley New Japan Summit, which was a two-day program including a number of panel discussions and also a lot of just meet and greet startup companies. So uh, this was exciting. We cooperated with the Bay Area Council Economic Institute with sponsorship from the Japanese consulate of, in San Francisco to put on a program in February about Japan and the Bay Area. Especially this year, the focus was on Bay Area companies working in Japan and with Japanese partners. I was happy to cooperate with uh, Dr. Shu, our keynote speaker, in putting on the US Asia CEO Forum in February where we had a smaller group, but um, C-level uh, personnel, about 50 um, CEOs, CTOs uh, were in uh, this meeting on corporate innovation and digital transformation. And another big one that we did was um, after we had to go online, we put on a special program in April with a panel of speakers in Bangkok and also in Silicon Valley about comparing uh, different approaches to entrepreneurship in uh, Silicon Valley and in Asia. We have given a lot of company presentations as much as possible. I give uh, large lectures to our member companies whenever I'm traveling to uh, their location. And um, we've, looked, we've given talks on a number of different topics. Digital transformation is becoming more and more popular. We've uh, given a number of other talks. Um, I was very honored to give a distinguished lecture at IBM Almaden Research Center this past November and at the Kojuncha Club. Kojuncha Club is Japan's oldest business networking club. It was established in 1880. And so this was kind of interesting. You can see the kind of people that we've been cooperating with. So this coming year, we're going to focus our fall flagship seminars on the topic of digital transformation among new and traditional industries in Asia. As much as possible, we will have speakers from Asian industry coming to talk about how data-driven approaches are changing their core business relationships and functions, not just adopting more in, uh, in information and communication technology. Please watch our website, asia.stanford.edu, to see what happens. We're also look, kind of exploring more on the practical aspects of artificial intelligence, especially reducing the cost of development and deployment. ML Ops is a new approach that kind of spun off of DevOps, and uh, we're doing a study of that right now. We're also looking at some other early stage technologies, blockchain and quantum computing, as well as really looking at what kind of deep tech businesses are emerging in Asia. The US-China friction is going to be a big thing for some time, and we're looking at that this year. And we're going to continue our work on open innovation and on Silicon Valley innovation and on new technology trends. So uh, 
that's really my part for uh, this first presentation. I do want to ask if uh, there are any questions to me. And I have to get so I can see the chat screen. Kimberly, did, did any questions come in or not? No, we haven't seen any questions um, in chat yet. Okay, great. So let me get the pictures out of the way so I can stop sharing my slides. And we will move right on to introduce our keynote speaker this afternoon. I'm uh, delighted to be able to introduce Dr. Chen Yang Xu, with whom I've cooperated for the last several years in regard to uh, a lot of programs on open innovation. And we're looking forward to an even more uh, kind of strategic level program in the future. Chen Yang uh, is currently uh, involved in a number of different activities. He is a co-founding partner of the Silicon Valley Future Academy. He's a managing partner of Brightway Venture Capital. He is also an advisory board member for Johns Hopkins University uh, Department of Biomedical Engineering. Uh, he got his PhD from Johns Hopkins in 1999 and promptly opened up Siemens first open innovation center, which is called uh, Technology to Business and is located over in Berkeley, which of course is where uh, Professor Chesborough was. So uh, Chen Yang knows uh, Dr. Chesborough very well. He uh, has been elected to be an IEEE fellow uh, in 2016, recognizing his commercial contributions to the field of artificial intelligence in computer vision and also medical imaging. Uh, he has authored over 80 publications and he holds over 40 international patents. So we're delighted uh, to ask uh, Chen Yang to uh, give us some remarks on the topic of open innovation as a strategy to solve uh, digital transformation challenges. Chen Yang, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Richard. First of all, I want to just get the thumbs up. You can hear me okay? Everybody on the panelists? It's okay? You can hear me? Good. Okay, very good. So, Richard, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to your annual meeting uh, and to speak to your affiliates and members and friends. Um, so, uh, so today I'm going to talk about uh, how, you know, open innovation can be a strategic and very important approach for driving and accelerating digital transformation. So let me go uh, now share the slides, see if I could be successful. Just one second. Sharing screen. Okay. Can everybody see the slide? Okay, very good. Uh, so I think the fact that we are having this meeting on Zoom, on video uh, from many locations, as opposed to be gathering at Stanford campus, it's a very strange thing. And it's a new experience. I don't think uh, we have experienced in the past in this way. So i like to start with my presentation with a picture from one of the episodes from my favorite TV series, Star Trek series, a big Trekkie. So it's called Strange New Work. I think that summarizes very well how we feel about today. You know, sometimes if you get the chance to get out of the house and walking on a trail and looking at the buildings, it looks the same as before two months ago, but nothing is the same because we all are confined in our room and then we're doing things in a very different way. And this episode in the Star Trek, it's the same thing. You go to a, a planet far away from the earth. It's more beautiful than earth. Everything looks really beautiful and pristine and they felt like home. But there's something strange in the air that actually are causing risk and endangering their lives. However, I think sometimes we talk about science fiction being something in the future, they can be more bold and uh, I would say uh, <laughs> exaggerating. But in this particular case, I thought where we're living is even much more exaggerating than what happened on the science fiction with their boldest imagination. 
because on that episode, nobody died, although they were endangered. But unfortunately, in this pandemic, we have so many people. We have by as of yesterday over you know three hundred. We have three hundred twenty one thousand five hundred ninety three lives lost. It's very very sad, and uh, the pace. It's every day we lost basically, uh, you know, a, a people we are in the tens of thousands, which think about it's, it's a whole university or a company, you know, if you line them up, that's just very saddening. And then the total confirmed infected, you know, patient are close to 5 million. So that's really, I think nobody could have imagined that, you know, this is happening in front of eye. So we're truly living a strange new world. Now, let me just give you, spend a minute or two to just give you a broad stroke of what I have seen. You know, I think many of you have seen even more, but I think to just set the pace. If you look at the pandemic, and there's no surprise, the pandemic is like a global cardiac arrest for the entire economy, and then the whole economy come to a stale, and therefore for months, and therefore economics forecasts for every single country, it's going from positive to negative. And that reversal is striking. And that hasn't happened before. And so that's the world we're living in. Now, the other thing is really about unemployment rate. Uh, this is a week old data. Uh, we're going to get new data soon. In America alone, there are 36 million American job loss. And in, within weeks reached 15% unemployment rate. And this is the fastest time in the history of losing so much jobs. And this is the highest since depression, Great Depression. Now, the forecast is when this whole thing reached the peak, and we're not at the end yet, we may go well above 20%, even reach 25%. That's the level of Great Depression. Obviously, when we're looking at these numbers, it's just a percent. But 20, 15 percent is one out of six people, and there's real people losing jobs. I have friends and, and colleagues at all levels. It's not even in the blue collar, but also white collar, even in the boardroom, are losing jobs. So the other strange thing is we see the fastest drop in the stock market, and people are panicking within weeks from the peak of the history in close to 3,500 for S&P 500. February 20th down to almost you know 2,300. That's 34 percent drop, faster than Great Depression, faster than Great Recession. But then it has the fastest bounce back, which is also very strange when so many people are losing jobs. Of course, there are many reasons, but now we're only 13 percent off the peak, right? So I'm not an economist, I'm not a stock market trader. I cannot predict, but I just want to point it out how strange it is. The world we're living. Now, a few weeks ago, uh, I saw the news of Neiman Marcus, you know, which we all know is a symbol of luxury fast and bankruptcy. You know, and my, you know, I think a lot of people knows about this and even shop there, particularly the ladies on the on this call. You know, it's 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 inconceivable to see a iconic brand like that is so quickly go under. And Neymar Marcus is not the only one. I mean, it's every industry affected. You look at Boeing, you look at all the airline company. In fact, the data I saw just the last week said, if you add all the airline company, you know, the United, the Dell to the Southwest, American, every single one of them, is less than the market cap of Zoom video communications that, you know, Professor Desha said earlier, right? And it's remarkable. And, and there are many companies went bankrupt, you know, or actually it's a lot more. As if it's not strange, now we got new behavior forming, right? You know, we, I, as a manager, you know, I always believe, you know, if people are let go, you need to let them go in a noble fashion. It's really people to people, right? And then, so you need to tell them and speak in front of the face. And there was a movie called Up in the Air. It's one of my favorite movies by George Clooney. It's all about digital disruption. There was a young lady coming to five people over the video. It basically did not work. But now it's happening. 
The other thing is now the new CEOs come on board. We have in the last two months, many new CEOs. Just yesterday, the United got a new CEO. A few weeks ago, the Disney got a new CEO. And these CEOs cannot even assume the job in the old fashioned way. They have to assume the job over a video and talking about new skills that have to learn and learn quickly. Now, some company go very bold. You know, I think a lot of companies say you can work from home. That's a forever debate. You know, home or office. Twitter CEO Jeff Doxy just announced that they allow their employees to work from home permanently. So, and yesterday also I saw very strange news, but it's happening. A court in Texas is holding the first jury trial by Zoom. But, you know, jury trial has to be in person. There's so much sophistication, you know, body language in examination. And now the fate of somebody who is in court is determined by voices, digital beats over a video stream. So that's just a really, really a tiny fraction of this strange new world we're living in. And just, just to set the tone. So the pandemic is not the only disruption. I mean, it's a global disruption, but we have experienced disruption everywhere, especially caused by digital transformation and digital revolution. And so if you look at the auto automotive industry, right, you know, that's the industry 10 years ago, you would think that's, you know, if you talk to every CEO of automotive and said they will be disrupted, and by a startup in Silicon Valley, I would think all of them would love that idea. You know, this is like a fortress and it takes decades, you know, and hundreds of years to really perfect that. But it's happening in front of our eye. And as of January 9th and Tesla, which the market share exceeded the combination of Ford and General Motors combined, two most iconic automotive brands in the world. And by February 6th, of course, Tesla went to a very wild run up. It actually not only exceeded, it's actually exceeded by a large margin, 135 billion over 82 billion. You may wonder how Tesla versus General Motors fought fair to the pandemic. Now, three months later, or more than three months later, you would think, see where they are. Let's look. So as of yesterday, I looked it up, Tesla market share goes up from February 6th by $14 billion. And let's look at General Motors and Ford. It goes down by $26 billion. And this is obviously as a snapshot where we go. We cannot predict the future. And you know, Tesla may be bank up you know, you know, a year from now. You know, a General Motor and Ford may very likely to grow very big again. Uh, we don't know and we cannot predict the future. But at least by looking up to today, especially with this global pandemic, this deep disruption, and Tesla is faring very much better than General Motor. And why? I, you know, from talking to many experts and also people from Tesla, I actually also know board member from Tesla before. I think from the, you know, as a, as a researcher on innovation, I really think the Tesla's competitive advantage is not only their battery. In fact, it's on their ability to be the leader on digital transformation in automotive industry. Specifically, on their car, it's a connected car. And there are many, many functions of the car. One of the functions of the car is over the air update. I experienced that with one of my colleagues who have that. We went to a restaurant, a dinner, and he want to, he got a notice on his phone. Do you want to update? You know, I said, don't do that. I don't want the car to be break. But he did that. Everything was fine. We came back from dinner. He had a brand, almost a brand new car with some new features, right? So these technology has been around for Tesla for a while, uh, yes, but then the other automotives still have challenge because they are leading. Uh, and the other one is autonomous driving. Obviously, we know Tesla is the leader in autonomous driving. Uh, they have most number of miles driven and more, more experience, more cars than any company in the world, including the Waymo from Google. The third one, actually, a lot of people may not familiar, especially if you're not in the automotive industry. You know, I have worked on the Siemens. You know, one of the main areas uh, automation for cars, including you know many other car brands I know. 
as digital factory. And their factory because no legacy and they can build ground up using the latest digital technology, automation technology, and give them an edge up to really produce a great car at cost and a speed that can meet customer demands. And they're not perfect, of course, they have some delivery hell with the Tesla 3, but they are long over that now. Last but not least, it's the digital marketing. And, and so the experience of buying a Tesla car, whether it's on the phone or on the internet, on the showroom, is very different from the traditional car. So if you're looking at Tesla is applying digital transformation on all aspects of their business, value delivery, production, and operation, and that make it very hard for other companies to beat it. So even if they have the great battery, they will still have challenge because they have to match the digital transformation. That's why the digital transformation is so critical. Now, obviously disruption doesn't happen in automotive industry. If I ask a poll to everybody of today, dependents, I'm sure you will come up with uh, many examples that will be beyond the two hands can come. But let me just recall four other. I think digital revolution is disrupting every industry. And I don't think that's an understatement. First, we experienced the from store to the e-store in the last 20 years. In fact, Amazon is so powerful and the retail industry just last year in the first quarter, 5,000 stores are closed. That was more than the year before, the entire year. So it's, and with pandemic, now you see even more so these physical stores struggling while Amazon stock is hitting new high. And the second one is from taxi to ride sharing. I don't know anyone now travel in the last year or two have, you know, not used the ride sharing. In fact, I think, I bet most of people may not even use a taxi anymore unless you are at the particular location that you have to use a taxi. What the world has changed. The other thing is uh, from cash to mobile pay. You know, I travel to China in particular last few years often. I think nowhere in the world has been experienced such a transformation at such a mega scale. 1.3 billion people in such a short time. And, you know, I think the joke is, and it's also a sad thing, it's a reality that the a beggar can no longer ask for cash because nobody carry a cash. It's all on their phone. So the beggar now have to have a QR code to ask people to drop them money through a WeChat or, or Alipay. And that's true. So, because I experienced also purchasing at the stand. Everybody do it digitally. The last one is an interesting example. and. Some of you may know, some of you don't. This is from gym to home fitness. Now, home fitness has been a long time, you know, not a very siloed, fragmented, small niche, while gym has become bigger and bigger because gym is built on real estate. Uh, one of the luxury groups does Equinox. They own 300 stores, started in New York City almost 30 years ago. It's a fantastic experience. Um, you know, I have one nearby. Um, and however, and a little startup in San Francisco called Peloton. And they basically eight years ago started with a bike and uh, a connected bike, a digital bike, where they can bring the top fitness coaches to your bike and guide you with different programs to get you motivated, to get you practice every day, rather than go to gym. What's the big deal? It is a very big deal. In eight years, not only as of now, they have over a million members, because they sell subscription, they sell the equipment, they sell all the contents, and it's not a traditional fitness company. They went IPO a year ago, and uh, at that time, I think it was about six billion. And they, obviously, you can imagine with pandemic, it's helping them even more. As of yesterday, they are valued at, I believe, $12 billion, right? So that tells you the power of digital transformation, digital revolution, every industry, if you put the digital transformation, you're on steroid, you're on exponential growth. If you can crack the business model, the execution and delivery and connect with your customers. So these waves of disruption is causing a mega problems for the incumbents. And so the incumbents can no longer rest on their or their success. And in 1958, if you work for S&P 500, the lifespan of that company is regarded as industry is expected to last 60 years. But fast forward for 20 years to 1980, if you work for S&P 500, 
lifespan shrink down to 25 years. And then another 35 years later, it come down to 18 years. And the prediction actually is, uh, uh, I don't get the latest data for this year, but it's supposed to be down to about 12, 13 years. And, and so what does it really mean, right? This is just a number. The other way to look at it is at the, that churn rate, 75% of the S&P 500 will be replaced by 2027, which is not long or not. And another thing is more than half of the Fortune 500 have been merged, acquired, become bankruptcy since 2000. Now for people who are maybe younger, 2000 felt a long time ago, you know, I just turned 50 recently, but that just felt like yesterday. So, so it's pretty scary. So I think these disruption, you know, these changes, uh, there are also other factors driving the change, you know, global trade, right? You know. Uh, regulatory and uh, uh, many, many other factors, not just the digital revolution, but it's causing big headache for the big company to continue to stay in the, in the leadership position. You know, let's look at some, you know, this is B2B or B2C. Let's look at, you know, a, a, a typical profile of a big conglomerate, right? I mean, the company has to deliver the absolute best in class customer values, right? And then they have to reduce the time to market, and enhance flexibility and so that the productivity goes up and the innovation is shorter, but also has to manage their resource efficient, more efficiently, right? And, uh, you know, the energy resource, you know, these are very expensive. I mean, Google is a good example. And, you know, what is power their massive data center? It's energy, right? Traditionally, you got from non-clean energy and then they have invested a lot of money buying wind farms, you know, solar farms. And to really have green energy for that and reduce the cost. And all these are already challenging for the CEO, the leaders, the employees of a company to just take a breath and to keep up with the pace. But this is just the inside what you want to do. Externally, customer is very unforgiving. I think they're less loyal at by the day. And they're very demanding if anyone else can offer a better service, better experience, and better price they will go to that provider. And that provider may not be you. A large company can fall, you know, to really trouble very quickly. Some even can bankrupt very quickly. While, you know, if it touches like a giant falling down and being stricken by, you know, lightning and they're dead, but their body is still warm. And it's pretty scary. On the other side, obviously we look at the low cost competitors, especially from, Countries like have a lower cost salary, China, India, you know, uh, you know, you name it, right? And uh, they come in, eat your lunch from the bottom. And this is uh, very, very difficult to operate. Uh, and that's why you see the CEO, uh, their uh, longevity is it's actually reducing as well. And the uh, board constantly wants to shift them to deal with this challenge and bring CEO who can keep up with the change. And the other thing is your competitors also don't stand still. Some competitors, they are more bold and audacious, and they figure out a way to stay ahead by transforming themselves, make themselves relevant in this digital era. And they are able to produce products that are faster, more automated, and cheaper and more personalized. And so that basically is a big headache. As if that's not enough, right? You also get over the barrier to enter a new market to come in, as well as many digital startups, and they come in and bundle your service, your business model, and your future high value added revenue. And we see how that happened in the cell phone business, right? You know, Apple and Google came in. You know, I have a lot of colleagues from telecommunication, uh, and they were not even thinking that was conceivable before that happened, and look at what happened. And same things happening in every industry. So this is a big shift in the competitive landscape. The traditional Michael Porter's competitive model is no longer enough, has to be augmented with more, because that's because of the digital technology. Mid competition, innovation can happen anywhere, any place, anytime, with anybody, and just instantaneously across the planet. So you have to leverage that. And so this is a forcing companies to innovate faster, you know, but transform digitally or be left behind. The question is how to transform faster. And I think the urgency for digital transformation 
if before the pandemic for certain industry, which may be slowly moving, uh, they can get by with that. Now, I think the pandemic make it even more so urgently. So why open innovation? You know, I have been really advocating this for a long time. It's a corporate strategic imperative against digital disruption. Uh, because if you're looking at digital transformation challenge, right, there, there are a couple of them. You know, one is often company go for the transformation simply as buying IT service, IT tools, and then they delegate to a chief information officer or chief technology officer or a new title to the chief digital transformation officer and just go by executing that. And they think if they get their office IT, company IT modernized, and that would be successful, often found that was not. That's only a one slice of that. And that's a big challenge for the CEO, the board, the leaders to really think about it. the big transformation is to transform the whole company, the culture, the mindset, the business model, and also new opportunity. The other one is often CEO and board in the traditional industry, uh, you know, they're a liability rather than a competitive advantage in this digital era. Some of them recognize their efficiency and they learn, they change. Some other time the CEO has replaced with a new CEO who has that mindset. And, and that's a challenge for a lot of traditional company. Another big challenge is lack of digital talents and culture. In fact, many of the digital talents, if you give them a traditional company versus a new digital native like Amazon or Google, guess where they go? Whether they are entry level or experience level, it's very hard for these companies to attract talents. If you cannot attract talents on digital, even if you're driving transformation, how can you succeed? Right? Who is going to execute that? The other thing is, of course, we talked a little bit earlier about changing customer demands, experience, value delivery. Many of them are shifting from offline to online and to do it through digitally. And if that was not apparent before the pandemic, now during the pandemic, this is apparent to everybody. And the other one is really a lot of companies are facing lagging legacy business model that made them successful you know, for decades, you know, for a long time, but now it's facing to be obsolete. And, and, and really in the end, it's all about, you know, challenge to keep up with the pace of the market innovation. Somebody else, you know, whether it's the your competitor or new entrant, I just move faster than you. And so that caused a lot of challenge. So where did that come from? I think that come from the fundamental model of the company innovation, which is a close to do it all innovation, that has been practiced for hundreds of years, over a hundred years. And I think that has been very successful uh, f before the digital era. But I think in the digital era, it's being unbundled. Uh, and uh, I think that model uh, is retreating. Uh, and uh, because with these close do it all innovation, right, you know, it's very standard R&D funnel. You get ideas come from the other side, ideas or talents, you develop them but you protect your IP, your product, your know-how, your trade secret, you know, lock them up, right? Chen Yang, Chen Yang, Chen Yang. We've lost your sound a little bit. Uh, Kimberly, can you hear me? Okay. Chen Yang, can you hear me? I think he may have froze. I'm going to try and message him. Yeah, I think. Uh, yeah, this is this is part of you know moving to online. Um, we will give uh, Chen Yang a try. Um, while uh, Kimberly's trying to reestablish contact, it's interesting how he's focusing on flexibility and also speed of innovation as really important factors behind uh, keeping up with digital transformation. Have you heard from him? What's happening? No, okay. Um, yeah, I, I'm kind of reminded of the image of a big ship where uh, 
you know, large companies are kind of like big ships. It's really hard for them to change uh, directions, but once they hit an iceberg, they sink pretty fast. It looks like he's dropped off. Maybe, maybe he will come to, back in a minute. Yeah. Okay. Let me look. Sorry. Uh, I, got, oh, uh, good. I got kicked off talking about uh, digital technology. We're not quite yet as good as the physical technology in person. So sorry about that. Let me share back my slide. Right. Thanks, Jen Young. Glad it's, uh, I'm glad it's a short disruption, not a long one. Yeah. Okay. So, so what Chesbro, Professor Chesbro uh, has recognized, uh, there are a lot of companies practicing new ways of innovating faster. And he summarized that into open innovation, which is really about not to close your forward and the R&D funnel, but opening up your entire innovation funnel in a strategic way. It doesn't mean to open up everything. So don't get confused. Open innovation is open up everything. That's not open innovation. Uh, that's naive, naive innovation. <laughs> it's really open up strategically like these holes in this picture are depicted to achieve strategic objective. That could mean sourcing technology from outside quicker uh, or means to take unused R&D results and spin them out into a new market and even to license into other firm where have a better resource and model to monetize on that and get financial return. So there's just there are many different ways which I'm going to cover that. Uh, and, and for those of you who are interested in knowing more, I highly recommend, I mean, there, I mean, right now, I think uh, Open Innovation has seven million, more than 7 million search terms on Google. You know, back in 2005, it's perhaps zero. It is zero, actually. Open Innovation means opening something up, Open Innovation Center, not the way we mean. Uh, but there are four books uh, by Professor Chesbro is the most authoritative guide on that. I do highly recommend. And then uh, one is the classical one, 2005, Open Innovation, that started this. Uh, and then the second one is the Open business models, 2006, and then there's the open service innovation, 2011. The newer one is called Open Innovation Results. It was launched last November. I was at the launch party. I got assigned a, paper, a book from Professor Chance and I looked at it. So that was a very good book. If you want to read one book, I would recommend start with the Open Innovation Results and read it backward. But in any case, uh, theory aside, uh, I think the, this is a powerful recognition of a shift in the fundamental innovation model of a corporate in the digital internet era. And by applying in the next remaining time, I want to show you just a glimpse, innovation can address all these challenges. And one thing is, you know, if, if you look at the corporate, what the, what's the, you know, the, 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 the purpose of corporate? It's basically produce value, right? And there's really two ways to do that. Uh, one is you have to define your core business, and grow your core from your competitors. The other one is really about growing your business. If you don't grow a new seat, right? The word shifted, we talked quite a bit, you cannot have it. However, these two types of innovation is very different, it require different leadership, different competence. On the one side, you know, the core, you have proven business model, you have, you know, you have market share competition, et cetera, et cetera. It's about value creation. On the new business side, it's really about disrupting innovation. There's so much unknown, so much risk, the business model unproven, you know, and, and it's a different DNA and team, and often you cannot do it within your company. So it's a very different way. One of the biggest mistakes a company does is to pick somebody who are from the core business, a rising star or a leader who have proved themselves and parachute them around the new business. And that's always the recipe for disaster. And why this is important, you know, I think a lot of companies for decades have struggled in how to put these two together. And I have, you know, been heading, I mean, I headed Siemens technology business uh, for, uh, you know, uh, from 2007, uh, 9 to 2017. And, and that was 18 years, uh, you know, operation for Siemens open innovation in the Bay Area for the globe. Uh, I could recognize, you know, as the head of that, that open innovation offers a way to unify the sustaining internal innovation with disruptive external innovation. In fact, open innovation combines both. We need a strong internal innovation to really engage external and vice versa. And again, I said open innovation is not opening up everything, but also another you know, thing I want to emphasize, open innovation is not external innovation. That's just one aspect of that. So I think open innovation offer uh, the, a model 
the modern innovation model for the corporate to deal with this challenge, which traditionally has been very difficult. Uh, what options you have with open innovation? I mean, this is a framework, you know, chart I made, I used it for a decade now. I think the common one is looking from the left, really about exploring new ideas, new strategy, but open up by, you know, going, looking beyond even your industry, the technology field. On the right side, you're more exploitation, you know, business model, product, you make it something, right? So you can sell. Then the other one is really about execution side. It's more functional. It's owned by a business unit or a department, maybe a chief technology officer or chief strategy officer or chief marketing officer. And they have specific challenge, you know, objective they want to achieve. They said, let's use open innovation to solve it. But I think that is not enough. In fact, I think a lot of open innovation outposts or centers or programs in many companies are belonging to the functional way. I think to and then this is why I contribute to many open innovation in an economic downturn over the years, and they got closed down. Uh, and uh, so, because I think that another dimension is often overlooked, but in the last few years, increasingly important is the strategic level of open innovation at the company level, at the CEO, at the board level that has to embrace it, has to drive it, because it's a very different innovation model. And I actually call, if you look at these four quadrants, if you're looking at strategic exploration, it's about what I call the blue ocean. It's about new business space. You try to experiment very quickly. You fail quickly. You experiment cheaply. Then you can you know, go to the exploitation phase. The, the, basically, the functional exploration is what I call a green creek. Uh, there's actually a green creek uh, north of the Northern California, and, but this has nothing to do with that. I just like the name. It's basically about new technology research, the product concept, uh, and many others. On the exploitation, functional exploitation is really about what I call the Yellow River. It's really about building a new product, a new service, and business model to go to market. It's really about making money with these. The last one is really about strategic exploitation. This is what I call the hot spring. This is really about going to new business growth, adjacency, new markets, and not to stay on the call or just expanding the call. Um, and so with that, you know, I told you, I'm gonna tell you a little bit more concrete uh, approaches. Uh, so here I'm just listing, there's hundreds of different ways of doing it. Uh, and, and obviously I'm not going to enumerate them here, but I'm just going to put a, a dozen of them on this canvas so you can see. One is commonly used as co-creation community. This is their lot. Uh, the idea is to crowdsourcing ideas like Ford Innovation Mobility. They get a lot of car concept design from their co-creation community. That's a strategic exploration. The other one is a startup competition, like the famous Cisco iPrice. And you get a lot of startups coming in to compete and to pitch their ideas. Uh, for the startups, it's a real thing, but for Cisco, it's still an idea. And that's more for them to see at the batch of all kinds of ideas related to the ecosystem what's going on. It's a very effective, efficient, and short time cycle approach to see, do strategic exploration than the original method. And then on the functional exploration on the technology side, the universal collaboration, uh, social listening, you know, pocket gamble, they listen from the customers, and open innovation challenge, you know, and Siemens has done one for smart grid and many others. But if you look at the functional exploitation, you know, one common one is to spin out unused technology, which you put a lot of money and didn't give you a return, rather than get to sit inside your four walls and trying to sell them all, spin them out. And some of them is also, there's another approach called spin around. Cisco is famous for doing that. They spin them out because they cannot grow. But once they grow big, you know, they buy them back, you know, if it's irrelevant. It's kind of interesting. Uh, the other one is the supply. Supplier enabled innovation. This is very common where you work with your supplier rather than just take the product they sell you, you co innovate, you share the risk. Uh, and also, you can work with the customer side as well. The open marketplace is also a functional exploitation, like Amazon. The open innovation center outpost, you know, it's an interesting uh, species. It's actually sitting in the middle, touch all four aspects. It's an integrated way to, for the corporate to really drive their in open innovation and to really be the hub to help companies for all four quadrants. Uh, there are many, many companies uh, doing that, you know, Fujitsu Open Innovation Gateway, Samsung Strategic Innovation Center, 
uh, and then the center I've you know had it before there are many of them then another one is corporate venture fund like the famous Intel Capital M2 obviously rebranded Microsoft Ventures and many others the investing innovative startups right and to watch how they grow and they could be the acquisition target or partner the other side on strategic uh, exploitation is really about uh, at the company level go for partnership co-innovation alliance at the company to company level that will allow you know a really driving forward uh, a company strategy uh, another one i mentioned is corporate m a cisco is famous for having the highest success rate and the most uh, i would say uh, uh, aggressive in driving corporate growth with acquisition uh, so when we are part of innovation digital transformation, uh, it's, you know, when we talk about the transformation, it's not one digital way. Uh, there are many ways. I like how Fujitsu uh, in one of the journals have It's like Chen Yang is frozen again. Are you back? Chen Yang. Chen Yang, can you hear me? He's still here. Yeah. For, he for, oh. uh, this, uh, for. Yeah, I think his audio is just not cooperating. Chen Yang. Yeah, um, I'm, it'll take us a minute to get him back, I think. He may have to drop out and come back in. I think he's doing just that. Yes. Uh, for everybody on the program, We'll sorry. let Chen Yang keep going oh, he's for back. a little sorry. bit. Uh, yeah, Chen Yang, just a, a note too. Uh, we are getting to the end of the segment. So yeah. if you okay. can not spend too long, that'd be great. Yeah. Okay. Hopefully also it's the last digital interruption. So in any case, I think the AR you know, wave is actually, there's also augmented reality blockchain 5G is actually causing uh, a lot of uh, challenge even for the, not just the digital immigrant, but also the, you know, the, the native, because it's not one wave and different approaches needed. And I think this is causing unique challenge. And each successful wave drive exponentially more people to people, people to things and things to things, real-time connectivity, communication, visibility, decision and action. And this put more demand for the company to go digital and agile and open. And so build scale and scale the company level of innovation capabilities become uh, imperative to keep up with the pace. Uh, I'm gonna skip the next one because of time, which is talk about even digital native, like leader IBM in the new wave of the AI is struggling. And there was a famous case for the IBM Watson, MD Anderson, a five year project. Uh, and there was a lot of hype. Uh, and uh, in the end, after $62 million, it failed. And uh, and, and then really in the end, the fundamental, the gist is the takeaway is they were running the, uh, the AR project, you know, in the healthcare space as IT product deployment and didn't, you know, accommodate the risk come with the AI, which is not deterministic. No matter how much success rate is a failure mode, didn't do enough validation. And there was a big study into that. And, and so this is why, you know, anybody in this new era will face the challenge. I mean, IBM now, Watson have revamped the strategy and approach has been making positive progress since then, but that was a spectacular failure. The other thing is the AI economy is really about the market data scale. And this chart from BCG, I liked a lot. Uh, it told, basically talk about the company, even the country level, US and China are leading, you know, if you're looking at capacity to upgrade industry on the horizontal and ability to innovate. And EU, if you look together, has a chance to go up but you know uh this is, eu is still struggling and if you look at the individual company uh they're all at so-called aspiring leaders you know and which is a great place to be but on commercial deployment the market is not as big as china and us so that also requires a company country level and company level to recognize that intrinsic 
challenge and build partnership across the globe using open innovation. Uh, and so this is very important. Uh, there are three examples. I'm going to just go through very quickly uh, because of time, uh, but I think they are important. Uh, these are short examples, uh, help to illustrate the point. Open innovation for digital transformation example. The first one is the uh, Fujitsu OIG, and then this is with Trust Bank. And I want to thank uh, Ryuma, Ohasi, and Div Mavit from Fujitsu for providing this case. And the OIG has been with the uh, Silicon Valley for five years, and it's one of my favorite open innovation center. And they basically have done uh, 30 successful projects with a very small team and created more than $150 million for the Fujitsu or business units alone. And, uh, but they also work with customers as well. Uh, with the Trust Bank, and basically the project is about using blockchain for commercial real estate. Uh, and they recognize the challenge, there's asymmetry in the information where the buyer don't get this enough information as real estate. And they want to really drive the transparency and uh, the trust so they can uh, create new business model. And then the way to do that, uh, rather, you know, in a secure and scalable way is to leveraging blockchain. And OIG have their unique way of doing it, a big picture, customer journey, customer search. So they explore that very systematically. And then they can also test it with their open innovation network experts and company. And in the end, uh, uh, they succeeded in that. And so a quote from general manager of Trust Bank said, they helped them to make a lot of small wings in the new space. And in the end to explore unforeseen business uh, and with full support, their top management team. And in this case, the full management team is behind. And they have learned the lessons really about digital transformation and strategically selecting capabilities, not doing everything, but select the one, and then also select the digital technology you want to go after. And then last but not least, is really balancing between the core business and your growth business. The second example is Ripple or Qatar Airways, uh, where uh, this is a special thanks to Nathan Naki, he's the uh, senior VP, I mean, the Vice President at Ripple Technologies, uh, they basically looked on uh, trying to uh, solve the cargo management problem where I have a lot of stakeholders, different parties, partners, and Qatar is one of the largest areas in the world, but it's very siloed. And in the cases, uh, they have a very innovative co-founding model to each one bring money and resource to join that, to solve that. And in the end, they were able to build this very ambitious uh, uh, you know, unified cargo management system promise. And the lesson learned is by combining forces, you can be better rather than just become a customer supplier. And this creates a competitive advantage for both. Uh, and uh, one thing is uh, not only Carta get what they want, uh, and then Ripple get Carta for as a customer going forward, they also can sell this to other customers. So it's a win-win situation. Last example is the Siemens Bowl deal. Uh, and thanks to Jiang Ming Chen who had this broad program. It's a very high profile program. It's, it's, between, it's the lighthouse program between Germany and China uh, and by two of the biggest company. And Bowu Steel is the second biggest steel company in the world, uh, biggest one in China. And they look at the 12 different scenario of digital transformation. It's very all encompassing. It's a multi-year of the entire steel factory you can see from digital plant, smart energy, smart intelligent logistics, and they go for co-innovation. But the way they did that is really through Siemens offer these uh, from bottom up different layers approach. And Siemens doesn't have all the business transformation. You know, some of 80% have it, 20% still have to source from the partners. So that customer collaboration created a great pool for Siemens even to accelerate digital transformation. And they have today got 21 projects down cover nine of the 12 scenario, which is remarkable speed and results. You know, that would not be possible without the open innovation. So I want to come back to, this is the end now, uh, to the strange new world I started at the beginning, that I want to offer some observation tips for you to take away. One, number one is leadership. You know, without CEO and board, you know, get and own the drive of the transformation from the top, I don't think this is going to be sustainable and successful uh, in the long run. It's as simple as that. The other one is strategy uh, and uh, really adopt open innovation to build and partner and buy digital competition at the company level to accelerate transformation is the key. Functional level can give you functional level success, but it's not going to shift. It really shifts the, the company as a whole. The third one is people, you know, 
it's all, it's, in the end, it's all about people. So we need to be able to identify the company, develop, empower both in open innovation and digital transformation, experts and leaders to lead the transformation. And this needs unwavering support. I use unwavering, I really mean it, uh, by the CEO and the senior leaders, but also carry the rest of the employees forward. And these leaders in open innovation, digital transformation, not only they are great technology business leader, they're great people leaders. So they know how to carry them in agile and you know, quick, effective way. The fourth one is really about process and the transformation objective milestone KPIs deliverable has to be clearly defined. You can do these small wings to really test it, but in the end, you have to really have a way to aggregate them to make a difference. And driving transparency and trust through the consistent regular communication with all stakeholders of company, including our partners or customers are very critical. And the fifth one is about customers. Uh, it's about co-create, innovate with lead customers through long-term partnership. This can create a very powerful boost to speed, the, speed up the transformation by your customer and yourself. You know, I gave you the examples just before. And the last one is about ecosystem. And in turn, this word is product solution. You know, the value chain is no longer enough. We truly have to really build our ecosystem, an open digital innovation ecosystem where a community of participants, customers, partners, and developer suppliers and users can engage actively and take on common topics around the digital vision and to push it forward. And that's really how you, your competitive advantage. So if you do all of that and more and really embrace open innovation as a strategic imperative for digital transformation, I believe that strange new world is no longer feeling strange and new. It will feel actually like home again. And so with that, I want to offer you guys to continue you know, uh, exploration and you welcome to contact me for discussion and collaboration. So uh, I know uh, now we're at the end of the talk. Thank you very much. Chen Yang, thank you very much for a really informative talk. I think uh, you highlighted not only takeaway points that are wonderful to keep in mind, but the diversity of reasons that companies have and different approaches, each of which needs to be kind of cultivated in its own way. I've got kind of one question for you before we move on to the next segment. And uh, the question really has to do with the last points, the takeaway points that you have is it possible or, or how can a company make sure that those six points are going to uh, move it forward? You know, uh, innovation, any kind of innovation has higher risk than not doing anything at all. And so there will always be people who are afraid of risk. How can you convince them that they really need to move forward? Yeah, I mean, I think the, but that's why I listed the leadership at the top. You know, for companies who have a CEO and a board who really embrace this uh, and who can drive it forward, and that would be the where to start. Now, not all companies are equipped with leaders who can do that. And I do think uh, the for you know uh, innovation leaders, you know, especially open innovation leader or digital transformation leaders, there are techniques. You know, because I myself have done that. You can use your particular with open innovation is very powerful. You can use the digital transformation leaders from other industries on your network and organizing a strategy and tour with your company leaders. And there are so many companies have done that. And then after one, two, three, maybe tour and their internal elaboration, and then the, you can transform the entire CEO and board to come on board and to really go behind that. And I think they are, these are really the holy grail. So, so I'm saying you, start, you, you have to build Regardless how you get there, you need a CEO and the board to really drive it from the top. But you know there are different ways to get there. You need to get that really in place to drive a sustainable and successful digital transformation innovation innovation journey forward. Okay, um, yeah, I think that's a great message and a really important message. I need to ask you to stop sharing your slide. <laughs> yeah, I'm done. Thank you very much. Thanks again. Um, and uh, confirm you will allow us to post your slides on our website? Yes. OK, great. So let me recommend that these will be a great resource for people to go back to. Uh, if um, to keep everybody uh, kind of informed, we are now at this point. We're a few minutes late. 
Uh, and what I'm going to ask is I'm going to ask for our three visiting scholars to give their presentations that are coming up. And uh, we will take a break, but it may be a little shorter and it will probably be a little bit later. Uh, so let me uh, turn over the uh, table to uh, Professor Takaki Hoda, who is with the uh, School of Business and Management of Kobe University. We're very happy that you've been with us uh, this year. Uh, Hoda Sensei, the floor is yours. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Great. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Takaki Hoda. I'm a uh, uh, associate professor from Kobe University, and then I'm a visiting scholar at uh, Stanford University from um, summer last year. And today I'm going to present my uh, recent research uh, thesis, uh, which is about um, alternative ecosystem for entrepreneurship in, sub in suburban and um, rural area. Okay, here I go. Okay. All right. Uh, some of you may not know uh, what uh, Kobe University is. So here is a bit of the information of uh, Kobe University. Uh, Kobe University, um, well, this is the uh, univer university ranking. Um, there are a couple of uh, sources for the university ranking and then you know, the ranking differs. But for uh, business areas and also the economics areas, Kobe University ranks uh, sixth in the Japanese, among the Japanese universities. And then these are the ranking from uh, worldwide uh, ranking series. And then I guess we are trying to be one of the top three, uh, but I guess uh, we are ranking you know, around like fifth uh, each year. And my personal background and research interest, I used to be an investment banker and entrepreneur and a venture capitalist. And then this is my 10th year as a professor. And then, so um, I used to be a corporate finance guy. And then this is my book, it's a little bit of propaganda, but uh, um, I guess uh, my uh, background gave me some insight as to you know, how Wall Street type uh, capitalism can function better for the society. And then I have some uh, skepticism, skepticism on capitalism. You know, I love capitalism and I'm a capitalist, but uh, you know, there's gotta be some way that, that, that the system can function much better. And then I'm kind of currently focusing on what about the, you know, the potential for the social finance. And then, and then my uh, interest goes on to, you know, uh, is there any social mechanism that can produce more entrepreneurs to solve social problems? Because in Japan, we have a lot of uh, social problems. And then, you know, uh, is the approach should be technology push or demand push? And my hypothesis here uh, now is that this uh, demand push approach may work. What does, mean, what does it mean? You know, I'm going to cover that later on. And then, um, we have two main social uh, problems in Japan. One is uh, aging society. The other one is uh, too much of uh, urbanization and we have to do something on that. And the re my research question is here. Um, one, you know, unicorn or local entrepreneurship. I guess our, um, uh, in Japan, we used to have this uh, traditional approach, which is, you know, let's increase the number of entrepreneurs and let's increase the number of startups, and then let's increase the number of IPOs. But the number of IPOs in Japan has been stable. It's been like, you know, 100, you know, roughly 100 IPOs each year. So it's not increasing. And then the total size of G Japan's GDP has been flat. So we have to come up with some alternative way, you know. And then I thought, you know, uh, in Japan, the traditional excellent companies such as Sony, Toshiba, and Toyota, you know, these are products driven, you know, no language necessary there, you know, the, the cars do not speak, you know, phones do not speak, you know, English is not important there. But going forward, like, you know, we've seen Google, Amazon, and those companies are coming out, and then I guess language may matter. So we have to probably come up with some alternative way to increase the GDP of Japan. And, um, Let's continue. And then I thought, what if the productivity or profitability of the regional companies, say non IPOable companies, you know, if they can improve their profitability, then that might help to uh, boost the GDP of Japan, nationwide GDP. And 
what if we could support the business development, the new product development in small to mid-sized enterprises, SMEs in suburban and rural areas? So that's my uh, um, research question. So we have to have some new ecosystem to support entrepreneurship for non-IPOable companies, uh, especially in suburban and rural areas. So hypothesis here, uh, create the demand first, and then companies in those areas would uh, do something to come up with a new products and services. And that would probably lead to uh, enhancing the entrepreneurship in those areas. So we have to probably have a different incubation system uh, for these areas. Uh, so that, that's something you know, different from urban areas. So I did a couple of uh, research, uh, academic research so far. Uh, one is on crowdfunding. And crowdfunding, uh, you probably you, you are familiar with what it is. And there were probably, uh, let me skip the, what, uh, how it works. But um, it basically is a mechanism uh, is that it tests and examines the demand first at online platform. And then if there's enough demand, then the company would go ahead and produce those uh, new products. And I conducted a survey uh, recently uh, to uh, regional financial institutions in Japanese, Chigin and the Shinyo Kinko and Shinyo Kumiai, and then, you know, to view how they recognize opportunity rising out of uh, crowdfunding. And then um, their response was that, um, you know, crowdfunding is effective in new product development as well as uh, enhance entrepreneurship and expand uh, sales area and brand awareness and support agriculture and fishery business. So majority of those, um, so these are positive answers. So majority of the regional financial institutions recognize crowdfunding is effective to a regional entrepreneurship. And this is kind of what is right, but uh, in Japan, we have some unique uh, civic crowdfunding uh, platform, which is uh, called the hometown tax donation. Uh, I'll skip the details of the mechanics here, but in Japanese, it is called the Furusato Noze. And it is basically a mechanism where uh, regional government or regional municipalities uh, buys uh, regional products from uh, regional companies at a huge, uh, uh, at, um, um, at some uh, price. And then they will give away those uh, products to uh, urban people. And so that the urban people would uh, can buy original products at a huge discount. And then this is you know, a creating a demand first because if the, if the government supports the sales of the regional companies, then the regional companies will be happy to produce more products. And then, so here uh, I did also did uh, academic research, uh, qualitative analysis, and then I revealed that um, local firms are inventing new products as well as uh, improving the quality of the existing products to be selected by the uh, regional government. So what it means is if there is uh, enough demand, then regional companies would do uh, better to, uh, um, uh, do the new product development and uh, you know new um, uh, services. So here um, uh, I, I say here incubation mechanism for suburban and rural area firms. Uh, this means that uh, if we can give some uh, training period for these uh, SMEs in the suburban areas, then uh, they would step onto the next level to enter into our uh, e-commerce business. And the last one is uh, regional digital currency. Um, in Japan, we are seeing some uh, regional digital currencies are uh, rising. Uh, it's aiming at you know, decreasing the money outflow and increase the money inflow from outside. It might better work if combined with FinTech and uh, uh, crowdfunding. And this is the uh, demography of the users uh, of one of the Japanese original digital currency. So it's an age. So you see two, two hikes here, around 40 years old. And surprisingly, we see you know, uh, ages around 60 years old are using this original digital currency. So you know, they are not really familiar with the digital stuff, but uh, they would uh, use this if they see some convenience there. So one case study for the large corporations is that um, it's, uh, there is a company in Wakayama, uh, the company's name is uh, Graft. 
and then they produced a uh, electronic motor bicycle and then they did a crowdfunding and then they uh, the amount of the money they raised was the biggest at that time like it was like a couple of years ago and later on yamaha motor uh, had a strategic alliance with this company so i guess this is one of the company that is some sort of an open innovation between the startups and in the rural area as well as a big corporation in japan so i guess uh i um I spent almost my time here, so let me finish up. Um, uh, ongoing future research in Silicon Valley for me is a formation of uh, social startups, and so potential for regional currency, fintech, and regional development, government tech, a new form of companies, and uh, impact of philanthropic money, pros and cons. And then it could be social problem solving, uh, or maybe it could be a social problem embedding. And the last one is a new form of uh, financing. So it uh, might be a disruptive effect and digital formation in uh, uh, financing industry, or is it just a temporary phenomenon? So this is uh, all about it. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Holda Sensei. I have a quick question for you. Mm -hmm. When you say social startup, are you thinking primarily of a for-profit company or are you yes. also including non-profits? Uh, for-profit for -profit companies. Okay. Thanks. This is very interesting. I look forward to continuing our cooperation. Thank you very much. Uh, you can stop sharing your slide. Hang on. Uh, yeah. Oh, I did. Uh, okay. Great. Thank you. And we'll move on to Ms. Aki Takahashi, who is the CEO of a startup company here named Brilliant Hope. Takahashi-san, the floor is yours. We can't hear you. Are you still muted? You may be muted. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, I do now, great. Yes, just a moment, please. Hmm. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. Hello everyone, I am Aki Takahashi and today I would like to talk about my experiences and the research I conducted this past year. I am the CEO of Musashi Sakai Driving School in Japan and Brilliant Hope in Silicon Valley. Also, I was visiting fellow at Asia Pacific Research Center from 2015 to 2017. And now I am currently a visiting scholar at the US Asia Technology Management Center. Why I am in Silicon Valley now, I am a CEO of a driving school, but I predicted that our industry will be disrupted by Silicon Valley technologies. And I wanted to discover the business trends in Silicon Valley to help make my driving school. Therefore, I came here from Japan in 2015 and I was shocked that Silicon Valley and Japan have such different business cultures. I can't uh, describe what is Silicon Valley clearly, even though I have lived here almost four years. But these are my impressions. First, people are eager to develop new businesses. When we want to develop a new business in Japan, we hesitate to talk about it and try it out. But the people who run businesses in the Silicon Valley don't hesitate to talk about and develop new businesses. Second, people are not afraid to experiment and failure. Our two cultures have different definitions of failing. Japanese people and their business culture think that failure is bad. But Silicon Valley people think that failure is part of the process to gain successful results. Of course, they feel disappointed when they experience failure. But Silicon Valley people have the power to change their own knowledge from their experiences. Third, events and networking. People and ideas attract people. I attended many events. I became aware that startup CEOs explain their product and their company's stories from pain points. 
those stories attract and involve more people. I thought that storytelling is very important in Silicon Valley. Fourth, business is a fast pace. Silicon Valley people work hard as they make decisions quickly to achieve their goals. In Japan, we spend a long time when deciding, uh, deciding something. But Silicon Valley people don't wait because they don't have enough time to wait. Finally, we can see that direction businesses are going in the future. When I arrived to Silicon Valley, I didn't predict that Tesla would have a big market. Online meetings are efficient, and that social media would have such a big impact in our life and businesses in Japan. But in fact, now Tesla has a big impact across the world. All generations of people use Zoom and other online meeting platforms um, every day, and we can take social media every day. We can see and predict five years and ten years later from Silicon Valley. At the same time, I had questioned how to apply this innovative culture to my Japanese business and why I work at the US Asia Technology Management Center. First, gain opportunity to attend many events and seminars. Second, network opportunities. When we can find, uh, we can find many events and seminars at this center, and we can come in contact with Silicon Valley's cutting edge technologies and meet up, meet startup CEOs. Also, this January, I attended a panel discussion with experienced women about women in Japanese business in a public seminar at this center. It was a great opportunity to reflect on my leadership and move forward in the future. Third, guidance and support. Dr. Dasha holds weekly individual meetings for us. This meeting is very valuable for us because uh, I can think, uh, I can think outside of box to develop businesses. Thank you very much. And this is my recent activities and research. When I had questions about how to apply this innovative Silicon Valley culture to my, my Japanese business, I thought that design thinking would be the best. What is design thinking? This method was developed by D school at Stanford University to make innovative products and companies. They suggested that when we want to make innovation, we need to walk through these five steps. First, emphasize. We need to really understand the customer's insight and ideas. Second, define. We find the customer's core problems. Third, ideate. We gather ideas to solve problems. Fourth, prototypes. We make prototypes to solve problems. Uh, ten, uh, fifth, test. We try out the prototypes in real life. Silicon Valley companies try this process quickly, but I was conflicted about our business culture gap. When I did design thinking workshop before in Japan, it was good, but it has not become our company's culture. I needed to practice and learn more and spend more time to change to a more innovative culture. So I decided to try the design thinking process in my actual life in Silicon Valley. I found out a good organic handmade skin care cream and I applied the design thinking process. When I started to the design thinking process, I made my hypothesis and target customers. My hypothesis, women have tried a lot of skincare before, but they couldn't find a good match for their skin. I call these women skincare refugees. Target customers, women who are around 40 years old.
how to use design thinking for this organic skincare. Emphasize, ask the family and the friends about their thoughts and conduct the questionnaire online. Defined, they like the multi-purpose cream. Ideas, more soft and meaty texture. Prototype, made prototypes of over 20 versions. Test prototypes in real situation over and over again. And tested were sold at gift shop in Carmel. This is the result. First, our target customers are not women in their 40s, but in their 60s. Second, Global organic personal care market site was $13.33 billion in 2018, so we have many competitors. Third, American and Japanese women don't feel good about their skin condition. First, if they have good skin, they feel more confident. These answers are from online questionnaire. 28 American women and 44 Japanese women who answered. Fourth, 82 of American women and 55 Japanese women use a minimal approach skincare. This is my next step. From this result, I built new hypothesis, target customers and industry. Target customers, human, who are over 60 years old with some skin problems. Industry try to shift to a uh, healthcare focus with the skincare industry. First, open website copy of Reflector uh, reflect a uh, more skin irritation focus. Show picture of customer's experiences and write a blog following monthly topic. For example, this month about pollen allergies. Next month, sun protection. In July, in July, healing dry skin, kind of this. And second, use more social media platforms such as Facebook and Instagram. I think that target customers who are 60 years old women may not use social media frequently, but we cannot ignore social media platforms. Third, create relationships with gift shops, um, di uh, dermatology clinics, and acupuncture clinics for B2C. Fourth, develop a range of wholesale platform for B2B. I am still researching what I could do through these experiences. Also, I'm networking to solve companies' problems. Thank you very much. Thanks, Takahashi-san. You can stop sharing your slides, but let me yes. ask a real quick question. Yes. Do you okay. think you would have tried this if you had stayed in Japan? Excuse me. Would you have tried to get started with the hand cream if you had stayed in Japan, if you had never come to Silicon Valley? No, no. Okay. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, could, uh, could, you, could you ask me again? Yes, I, I'm so would sorry. You have, would you have tried to do a new business mm -hmm. in this way? Would you have thought about it in this way if you had stayed in Japan and not come to the United States, not come to Silicon Valley? Yeah, I, I love Silicon Valley. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, I, yeah, I, yeah, I want to try, and I need to understand both. Okay. Yeah, yeah and the other countries. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for uh, your presentation. We'll move on and ask uh, Mr. Shota Yamaguchi, who is with the Mitsubishi Research Institute, to talk about your research this year. Yamaguchi-san, floor is yours. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Sensei. Give me a moment, please. So can you hear me and can you see my slides? Yes, looks good. Okay, so uh, first of all, uh, thank you Dasha Sensei for organizing this event and uh, giving me this opportunity to share my research today. And uh, so before I start the main part of my uh, presentation, let me briefly introduce my company and myself. I am Shota Yamaguchi 
and I have been working for Mitsubishi Research Institute since 2014. And the Mitsubishi Research Institute is a Japanese think tank uh, founded in uh, 1970 in commemoration of uh, 100th year anniversary of Mitsubishi Group. And uh, we are happy to announce that uh, we celebrate our 50 uh, year anniversary this year in 2020. And uh, our mission is to uh, resolve social issues both in Japan and throughout the world uh, through our think tank uh, consultation and ICT capabilities. And with respect to relationship with Stanford uh, uh, University, uh, we start sending researcher and have worked with uh, Dasha Sensei uh, since 2014. And um, as I belong to healthcare and wellness division in my company and have joined the project mainly on medical device industry, I studied on uh, digital health industry in the United States since last summer at Stanford. So today I'd like to share my, a part of my research on digital health industry in the United States. And I'm going to talk about the digital health venture investment trend and uh, regulation policy and new players in this industry. So first, uh, let's confirm the definition of digital health. Uh, so actually there are not a single definition and it varies uh, organization to organization. However, what is in common among these definitions is that it covers not only technologies uh, for medical use, but also includes the uh, uh, health and wellness. So as an example here, I show how FDA and uh, HIMMS explain about the digital health on their website. You can see in the highlighted words that both cover health and wellness. And next, uh, let's look at the trend of venture funding. Uh, this graph shows the venture funding of digital health in the United States. And according to the report of Rock Health, uh, venture fund uh, focuses on digital health. Total venture funding was 1.1 billion US dollar in, in uh, 2011, and it increases to 7.4 billion in uh, 2019. And number of deals has been also increasing. And if you look at the categories that are uh, intensively funded, uh, genomics and big data and wearables were ranked in the top three uh, areas in 2016. And it's shifted to fit fitness and wellness, telemedicine and uh, disease monitoring. Okay. And, oops, sorry. Oh, something is wrong. Sorry. Um, okay. Yeah. And uh, so, Let's move on to, oh, sorry, about the, the regulation. And in response to the expansion of the digital health industry, uh, federal and the state government have taken lead uh, in uh, establishing a variety of regulations and the guidelines to keep up with the uh, pace of technological, uh, technological progress. Uh, with respect to privacy and security, uh, uh, health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, so-called HIPAA, is the most representative regulation. And HIPAA was enacted uh, a little bit uh, uh, older. It's, uh, it's uh, enacted in 1996, and, uh, but it's tightened its uh, penalty and other provision by uh, subsequent laws. And recently, in January of this year, California IoT security law uh, the first IoT security law in the United States was enacted. And the California Consumer Privacy uh, Act was also came into force and which requires companies to prepare a system to be able to respond to consumer requests to disclose or delete their uh, personal information. And also these two uh, laws, uh, regulations, uh, uh, state uh, regulation in California uh, they will become the standard for the entire country because California has the largest population in the United States. And uh, with respect to FDA regulation, FDA has issued uh, various uh, regulations and, and, uh, and uh, to clarify the boundaries between medical and health in the digital health space. And in 2016, the 21st Century Cure Act came into force, and which led to the uh, 
publication of a digital health innovation uh, action plan. And this action plan uh, provides a guidance to such as uh, medical uh, mobile applications and the general awareness product. And also a new program called the pre-certification uh, pre program uh, was uh, trialed in uh, 2017. And this program simplifies the application process for medical software by pre-certifying the company itself uh, rather than the individual softwares. And it is interesting that the Apple and Fitbit are also included in the first nine uh, companies that are certified with this program. Okay, and then let's go to the next page and uh, I will talk about the new players. Uh, new players enter digital health industry, which was previously dominated by insurance companies, pharmaceutical companies, and the medical companies. And a great example is that uh, entry of the tech, uh, tech giants like uh, Faga, they enter the industry with uh, their large access to B2C market and their capability on data analysis. Uh, for example, uh, Google has been investing actively in the AI for many years, and recently it, re uh, it actively collaborated with medical organization to create an uh, efficient health data system. And uh, Google is also moving into the collection of health and wellness data. And uh, acquisition of Fitbit last year uh, was uh, one of the, uh, Google's largest deals. And Apple is also building a health information uh, management platform that works uh, on the iPhone app and other devices. And especially from uh, Apple Watch Series 4, uh, it uh, received the uh, FDA clearance for its apps for uh, irregularism notification and ECG monitoring. And Amazon, uh, it opens an online store for healthcare products that can be purchased with the tax advantage uh, account, uh, advanced account. And uh, in addition, Amazon recently announced that Alexa is now HIPAA compliant so that the exchange of uh, healthcare information using Alexa will be uh, more and more active uh, near in the future. So here's a conclusion and let me summarize the, my presentation. Uh, first, uh, people's growing interest in their health is expanding to include health management in addition to the conventional treatment and the prevention. And accordingly, digital health industry grows as an area that approaches not only medical, but also health and wellness. And secondly, uh, venture investment in the digital health space has become, uh, active, uh, become active over the past decade, and it is expected to continue to grow. And thirdly, uh, in response to technological advantage, uh, corporate and corporate developments, uh, regulation is uh, also uh, being de uh, developed. And for digital health company, it, be, it will be the uh, hurdle for their uh, business activity. But on the other hand, uh, these regulation will uh, uh, act as an uh, infrastructure leading to the development safer and higher quality uh, products and, uh, in the future. And finally, the digital health spa uh, space is seeing a flurry of new players. Uh, such as tech giants. And these companies are changing the dynamics of uh, existing healthcare armed with a large customer access and uh, data analytic capabilities. So that is my end of the presentation. Thank you for listening. Yamaguchi-san, thank you very much. Uh, for everybody who is participating in the webinar, I'd like to encourage you, if you are interested in talking more with our visiting scholars, send us a note. It's easy to find us through our website, asia.stanford.edu. We will post these uh, presentations, and uh, I'm sure that our visiting scholars would love to hear from you if you're interested. Uh, for now, we are at our first break, uh, and so we will take a five-minute break at this point and return right about 4.50 p.m. So we're running 20 minutes late, but that's not too bad. Uh, it was a little bit for each person. So we'll take a five-minute break and come back 4.50 p.m. Thanks, everybody.
I realize that was a rather short break, but we have an action packed uh, afternoon. And uh, I'm kind of excited to move ahead to our next set of uh, three visiting scholars. So our uh, next set of presentations will be by um, Mr. Ajay Joseph of Bridgestone Corporation, Mr. Zach Okazaki of Nippon Life Insurance, and uh, Ms. Christiana Shu of Kawasaki Heavy, and Mr. Hiro Nishinaka of Ishin Company. So let me get out of the way and ask for uh, Ajay. Uh, you have the floor if you would uh, start your slides. Uh, hello, Professor Dasha. Uh, are you able to see my screen? You sound great, and we see your slides. OK, good. Uh, so uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon to everybody uh, out there. I'm really uh, honored by giving me this opportunity uh, to share my research. Uh, so I'm Ajay Joseph uh, from Bridgestone Corporation. Uh, my background is in enterprise IT and uh, I belong to the Nest Lab organization within Bridgestone. So today I will be uh, sharing you about the research that I've done uh, in data platform technology uh, during my stay as a visiting scholar over here. Uh, so about uh, Bridgestone, uh, many of you would have heard about us. Uh, so we are a, a, a tire maker and we sell uh, all kinds of tires. So apart from that, we also make some uh, diversified products such as uh, sporting equipments and uh, automotive uh, auxiliary products. Uh, having said that, 80% of our revenues uh, comes from tires. So in the early 2000s, uh, uh, about the big three tire makers, Bridgestone, Michelin, Goodyear, to get put together, had a market share of 50 plus percentage of the global market. Um, right now, it's in the uh, it's less than the uh, mid 40s. Okay, so as uh, Dr. Shu pointed out in his presentation, so on one uh, on one side we are we are facing the threat from lower cost competitors, and on the other side we are facing uh, uh, the digital disruption happening. So we have uh, already noticed the threat and we are uh, going to prepare ourselves uh, for the next phase. And that is uh, what we call as a TNT pass, which is a tire and diversified products uh, as a solution uh, to contribute to the upcoming mobility as a service things. So we already have our retail outlets, our service centers, and we also have a strong product or engineering. So we would like to uh, connect these two uh, using the uh, digital technologies and create more value uh, for the end customer. So I would like to brief about my uh, uh, organization called Nest Lab in Bridgestone. So uh, we have a, a existing business that is taken care of by uh, SBU, what we call as strategic business units. Uh, they take care of the uh, existing products and also scaling it up uh, to new markets. Whereas Nest Lab, we are focused on finding out what are the potential disruptive uh, forces that are going to uh, affect our business and how can we kind of uh, utilize them and create a new uh, uh, business model. And in some cases, we also uh, do a proof of concept uh, to validate the uh, business outcome out of it and partner with the uh, business units uh, to scale it up. So Nest Lab has been uh, engaging with the uh, US Asia Technology Management Center since 2018. And so far we have uh, sent uh, six uh, people from Bridgestone who have uh, come to Stanford as a visiting scholar. And they have learned uh, a lot from this experience and they've also gone back and are contributing to our uh, change in the organization culture and so on. Uh, have, uh, having this brief information about this, about my firm, uh, let me move into my research areas uh, during my stay here. So since my background is in IT, uh, I was uh, more interested in the technologies that are used by uh, firms in Silicon Valley uh, for their mobility, uh, big data collection and processing, and also how much of the open source software are they really using in enterprise? And also any, uh, any of a potential next big technology that is going to uh, arise and disrupt the business. So these are the three uh, areas of my interest and I'll elaborate on uh, each one of them in my next slides. 
So uh, we being an, a big enterprise, so any software, uh, we will deal with uh, mostly the enterprise uh, IT vendors, so-called like Microsoft, Cisco, uh, IBM, Oracle, so on. So my knowledge up before coming here uh, was uh, mostly on Microsoft. So any uh, technology uh, on data processing, I would uh, use uh, Microsoft and open source is kind of dismissed uh, right from the start. So this slide shows you a list of components from Microsoft's own cloud offering called Azure. Uh, so when these components put together, you can utilize them to collect data, store it, and process it, and also create applications uh, using just uh, Azure's uh, stack. Okay, we can it, this can be used to handle uh, the, both the real-time sensor data as well as uh, batch uh, data that comes in. Okay, so I thought, what what are Silicon Valley companies uh, uh, doing uh, about this kind of technologies? So I I've atten attended some. Uh, uh, events uh, that were held by the data engineers in Uber, uh, Salesforce, LinkedIn. And to my surprise, I didn't see even a single product from the enterprise IT vendors. They're all talking about Apache, Kafka, uh, Apache Hadoop, uh, Kafka, Docker, and so on. And most of these uh, words were alien to me. My, uh, to me. And I, heard, and I had a friend of mine who was working in Tesla, and I just asked him like, what ERP are you using? Is it SAP, uh, which is a big ERP vendor? And then he said, Tesla, they built their own ERP, which is kind of unbelievable. No big enterprise would, or even a startup would they think about building their own ERP. So that's how uh, the ecosystem over here. So I thought, okay, what if I kind of, uh, plot these open source technologies back to the Microsoft architecture and see if they can replace the entire thing. So this slide will show you just, I replaced all the individual Microsoft components with open source counterparts and you can re almost recreate the entire stuff. So this, uh, I sent this information to back to my middle management in Japan. Uh, so they have noticed and now they feel that in the future strategy, they would, they would also have to assess uh, open source technologies and see how much of a gain they can get uh, if they go towards open source. So, so far we have been dismissed of, dismissive about it, but now we are really starting to think about it. Already we are using a Python uh, for our data science uh, uh, projects. So that's a starting step, good starting step for us. Uh, of course, Silicon Valley is uh, uh, kind of, uh, you have the advantage of having a really uh, readily available skilled workforce. Uh, so that is a big uh, kind of a pain point for us. If, is the skill force really available or do you have to train them? How much of an effort is, does it require on this side? So all of these stuff uh, will have to be studied by us. And next is about what is the uh, kind of next big potential technology that is going to disrupt uh, industries. So uh, according to me, uh, one is blockchain, uh, one of the potential next big technology frontiers. So many of you, when you heard of blockchain, you would have uh, my image about Bitcoin, which is a cryptocurrency that utilizes blockchain. But actually blockchain, uh, but cryptocurrency is only scratching the surface of a uh, blockchain. Uh, in its primitive stage, blockchain is nothing but a new way to store data and, and uh, share that data to others. Okay, so you have data that is uh, stored in blocks, in chunks of data. And those data, uh, uh, when a new, some addition has happened to it, it is, uh, it is created as a new block with a modified section. And the new section and the old section, they are kind of uh, connected to each other by some kind of key ID so that you can track the entire changes that have been done. So a block might contain uh, 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 information about the source from where has been uh, obtained and the destination and the value of the data, okay? So this information is encrypted and uh, you, only some, you need some uh, uh, complex, uh, you need to solve some complex algorithms to change the data. So it is entirely distributed. For example, Bitcoin, the entire network of Bitcoin is about 120 gigabytes or so in that order and it's growing. So you can store that entire data in some cell phones, uh, some smartphones are capable of uh, even handling that data. But going up, apart from cryptocurrencies, uh, what 
else will they do? So I think- uh, About two minutes, Ajay. Yes, okay. So blockchain will become the underlying data layer in the internet is what I foresee. And this data will be delivered to the data analytics function. You have internet of things that's coming up and maybe even smartphone applications will be built on top of the blockchain, providing much greater transparency from the source of the data to the destination. And uh, so that one organization alone will not be able to control the uh, internet. Okay. And having said that, uh, this, uh, uh, this is the kind of almost uh, uh, my research topics uh, in short time that I had about five months. So I would like to conclude my presentation. So uh, I learned from Silicon Valley firms that uh, they are almost into open source architecture. Uh, the benefits uh, being that they can avoid their dependence on any one particular I enterprise IT vendor. They can also gain advantage in licensing fees, so on. And blockchain is a technology that is kind of, uh, evaluating, uh, kind of evolving with many players coming in, each trying to solve one particular problem. I think this uh, technology will have to be kind of periodic, uh, periodically evaluated by us at Bridgestone and also kind of do some uh, uh, use cases uh, as a proof of concept uh, to kind of measure the value that we can gain out of it. So that uh, we don't have to wait till uh, we have any uh, universal accepted standards uh, to uh, scale up blockchain technology. And finally, uh, this is just uh, an op kind of the thing that I've noticed uh, after coming to Silicon Valley is that the network effect. Uh, people kind of uh, hold events almost every day. And in the weekdays, uh, those events, uh, the tech-related events, uh, they are held after office workers, where pe many people from different uh, fields come together, they share the ideas, uh, they exchange uh, discussions, so on. So I had a person sitting next to me, beside me, who was, uh, it's not a big event, it was only like 20, 25 people. Uh, it was a DevOps-related event. And person next, sitting next to me was a chief as an executive officer in the security and the compliance side of one of the top security uh, software related uh, firms, okay? So he, I was able to talk to him uh, and it, I was really surprised for a person of his kind of a status who's coming to a small level events and seeing what's happening around the world. So the executives in Silicon Valley are really, really very uh, tech savvy. Uh, so they always want to know what's happening in the field, which is kind of different in Japan, uh, where the top executives uh, kind of, uh, not uh, is what you call IT literacy. They're not uh, much well versed in IT literacy. And the time they spend after office workers is what defines the ideas. I think uh, that's one thing we'll, I will take uh, out of it. And even after, I mean, going back, I, will, I would like to spend time in, uh, in events and try to gain as much information and uh, apply it as possible. Uh, that's all with my presentation. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Ajay. And let me say that I'm really impressed with how much you've done in a short period of time, and including, you know, kind of coming to some possibly life-changing realizations. Uh, we're very happy that we will keep contact with our visiting scholars even after they go back to Japan, because a lot of the kinds of things that you've learned here are not easy to implement overnight. And so we do look forward to continuing to build up the community of uh, visiting scholar alumni in Bridgestone and in our other member companies. If you would stop sharing your screen, I'd like to uh, move on and ask Mr. Okazaki, Mr. Takashi Zak Okazaki of Nippon Life to give a presentation. Takashi-san, are you here? Good, great. Uh, are you muted? Okay, uh, can you hear Great. me clearly? Yeah. I can hear you. Great. Okay, uh, thank you for the introduction, uh, Dr. Dasher. And uh, I'm Zach Okazaki, and I am a head of uh, US uh, R&D at Nippon Life Innovation Center, uh, which is called uh, Nippon Life X. And I started here in 2017, and I became a visiting scholar of uh, US Asia Technology Management Center from last year. And today, uh, I'm going to brief on the current status of our activities with USATMC as a visiting scholar. 
And first, uh, let me start with an overview of Nippon Life. Uh, since it was founded in uh, 1889, uh, when the Japan's first modern constitution, a Meiji Kenpo, uh, came into effect, and Nippon Life has been helping people uh, live, uh, live their safety lives as one of the oldest mutual uh, life insurance companies. And uh, as you can see on the right hand side, uh, we are fourth ranked insurance company in the world and the largest one in Japan. And uh, Nippon Life has an, an innovation group inside, uh, which is called Nippon Life X, as I mentioned earlier. And uh, there are four locations in this network around the world, uh, Tokyo, Beijing, uh, London, and Silicon Valley. And the Silicon Valley office is the oldest among the four, and it was opened in the autumn of uh, 2016. And uh, what is unique is that the uh, Silicon Valley office was opened earlier than Tokyo office. And uh, in that sense, uh, Silicon Valley also has been uh, leading our innovation activities over, uh, over, over our company. And uh, as you can see, uh, what our offices do on the right. And our office in Palo Alto has been involved in all three areas, uh, research, uh, investment, and uh, POCs and business development. And then uh, this is the vision of uh, Nippon Life X. Our vision is to uh, go beyond uh, traditional insurance business to help people have better lives in, the, in this uh, digital economy uh, with uh, greater to grave customer support. And as shown in the figure, uh, we aim to develop uh, services that combine the insurance related applications uh, with new type of insurance utilizing technology. In the uh, adjacent P and C, uh, property and casualty uh, insurance industry, uh, there are actual examples that the Uber and the Tesla has, have uh, become insurance providers. And uh, their current business is to use technology uh, to provide uh, on-demand and personalized services that combines uh, their existing services with insurance. And uh, they may develop more uh, innovative business uh, in the near future. And uh, in the life insurance industry, uh, we are also seeing the same move uh, that the tech companies enter the industry gradually. So uh, most importantly, uh, the, the new value of the uh, insurance could come from outside of the industry. So we'd like to uh, bundle insurance related applications and the life insurance product to go beyond current business. And that's why we work with uh, uh, tech companies and the startup companies, accelerators and the universities in order to achieve the vision. And now uh, allow me to move on to what I've been doing with Stanford. And here's a summary of that. And as you can see uh, listed on the right hand side, there are four topics I'm focusing on as a visiting scholar. So I'm gonna briefly explain one by one in the following slides. And the first one is uh, understanding open innovation culture, which is powerful base for innovation. And uh, uh, in a connected digital world, uh, which is a fast changing environment, it is important for companies to explore a wide range of internal and external sources for innovative opportunities. However, even though many traditional companies know the terms open innovation, it seems they don't understand its essence correctly. So uh, therefore, uh, as shown on the right, I reported to uh, reported open innovation theory I learned under Dr. Dasher to my company. And sometimes I take our executives to Stanford University to help them understand what open innovation means to our company. And the second, academic study of innovation management. Why does Nippon Life need academic study? The reason why it is necessary for us is because innovation is easy to misunderstand since there is a lot of uh, diverse, diversity and differences inside innovation. And it is also true that uh, a bunch of innovation comes from startups. And uh, this is something uh, Nippon Life has not been familiar with uh, until now. So academic study helps us understand multiple cases of innovation and helps better management of innovation uh, with organized framework. So I put the example I've been learning on the right hand side, uh, such as a research method and an evaluation model for startups and the others. And the third one uh, is uh, researching future technology business. And uh, one of our mission is to identify future disruptive threats as soon as possible and uh, take action to address them. 
An example of possible future disruptive threats to our industry uh, includes a new way of calculating human risks and our market entries by tech companies. And uh, uh, as you can see uh, on the right hand side, uh, with our US ATMC, uh, I've conducted several researches in the specific areas of interest, especially for uh, our future technology business, uh, such as genomics for insurance. And uh, my research work at Stanford University allows me to cover emerging technologies. This, uh, this helps us to understand future possible business as well. And the last one is uh, transferring knowledge for estab establishing business relationship. And I'm trying to uh, take what I'm learning and uh, to turn it into my skills by uh, testing out my knowledge in a real scene. And specifically, when I talk to startup uh, inside and outside of Stanford Network, I always try to use uh, the knowledge. And uh, this uh, learning by doing way is extremely uh, effective for the study at Stanford. And uh, this is because uh, I can have a face-to-face -face meeting uh, with an uh, uh, innovative startup on the same day I, learn, uh, I study at Stanford. And this is, I think this is a, a Silicon Valley specific uh, feature. And uh, this is also important for me to evaluate the study processes through uh, uh, learning by doing cycle. And uh, in, con uh, in closing, uh, I'd like to say thank you to uh, Dr. Dasha, staff at USATMC, and uh, visiting all visiting scholars. And the time at Stanford uh, really uh, helps me to have organized a framework to uh, understand innovation and, and uh, 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 do my own activities. And with that knowledge, I keep uh, trying to uh, seek for innovation and uh, to identify how can I, uh, I can change my company, and which is a huge uh, traditional Japanese company. And uh, well, uh, I guess that is. Thank you. Well, Kazaki-san, thank you for your kind words. It's our privilege to work with people in companies who are all interested in moving forward and uh, doing things that will create value in the future. So uh, we'll move right along. Okazaki-san, well, thank you very much for your presentation. You. Our next presentation is by Ms. Christiana Shu of Kawasaki Heavy Industries. Christiana, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Christiana and uh, I work for Kawasaki Heavy Industries. And today uh, I'm going to cover the innovation activities of Kawasaki and some progress about working with Professor Desher at Stanford. So before I start uh, a brief introduction about myself, um, I started my career at Kawasaki in Tokyo and in my third year, uh, which was 2016, I was assigned to Silicon Valley to set up corporate innovation activities. Um, I have been responsible for building connections across in uh, different industries in technology communities and identifying relevant emerging technologies and um, investment opportunities. So being the first one in this position has been very challenging, but very exciting. And uh, working with Professor Desher is a very fascinating uh, working experience for me. And uh, he always provides me valuable insights to step further and achieve more. So beyond those, uh, I'm, I am also volunteering at Kids at Silicon Valley as a program manager. Um, I will share more about this later. So moving along to my presentation, I would like to start off with a brief overview about Kawasaki. So oftentimes people uh, consider Kawasaki as a motorbike company. Um, as a matter of fact, it started as a shipbuilding company in 1878 and then expanded the business into aerospace, uh, high speed trains, and machineries. So, with the, uh, over the 120 years of hard work, Kawasaki has scaled into a global leader 
uh, which has $14 billion of revenue, and there are over 35,000 uh, employees in 93 locations all over the world. But how to remain successful and stay strong for the next 120 years? The more focus on innovation should be placed. Particularly, uh, world is rapidly changing and available knowledge is highly distributed. It is critical to leverage external resources to accelerate internal R&D or even expand or create an addressable market. So um, urge to capture the value of emerging technologies, Kawasaki started, the, uh, started to explore the benefit of open innovation. And in October uh, 2016, my colleague uh, from corporate R&D and I from corporate planning relocated to Silicon Valley and launched the innovation activities. We work very closely as a team to identify promising partners, uh, make recommendations, uh, initiate contacts, and support the process of partnership implementations. So up, ultimately the goal is to provide more options for corporates for uh, future growth. Since uh, Kawasaki is a heavy equipment manufacturing company, we are more interested in automation, uh, robotics, artificial intelligence, um, mobility systems, and IoT in industrial settings. And we are very active in collaborating with startups. And uh, we have announced an investment in Osaro and a partnership with Dexterity. They are very strong in computer vision, especially uh, the applications in logistics. So besides working with startups, we also engage with universities and incubators to have a primary uh, access to advanced research. So we gain open innovation knowledge uh, from Professor Dexter at Stanford, and we have a co-R&D uh, uh, on robotics uh, at, and AI at MIT and uh, UC Berkeley. And we also joined the deep tech incubator uh, like Evo Nexus uh, based in San Diego and Live Nest based in Tokyo. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, we started the activity uh, from scratch. It was very challenging, but very luckily I have always been receiving support and uh, inspiration from Professor Desher. Um, who provides me all the confidence and knowledge to embrace this adventure. And Kawasaki joined the program three years ago, and we have been working on building fundamental uh, understandings on open innovation, learning um, techniques about evaluating partners. And over the past the three years, Professor Dasher gave talks um, in Japan inside of Kawasaki for several times um, in total, we have over 300 employees attended, including our CEO and other top management class. It demonstrates that we are very uh, actively in innovation culture inside the company. And as a solid outcome for this program, I finished up my report about open innovation in large companies, uh, focusing on why closed innovation is not sustainable anymore, and uh, why there is an urgency to, uh, to be open to collaborate with external partners. And I also introduced the possible approaches or tools in the market at the moment. So additionally, we are working with Professor Desher in a very interactive way. So last year, uh, our partner LeapMind, a Tokyo-based AR start, uh, AI startup uh, backed by Intel Capital and Toyota, joined the uh, professor's fall uh, series on edge computing. And the chief scientist of LeapMind gave a talk about their approaches of 
uh, creating innovative devices with machine learning capabilities. He also introduced their, uh, our project um, and uh, their computer vision solution to real-time small objectives uh, detection around the train door area. So lastly, uh, about my involvement beyond my responsibilities at Kawasaki, I am also a volunteer program manager uh, at uh, Keizai Silicon Valley. It is a US-Japan uh, business-oriented nonprofit organization. And I hosted an event uh, last year in November on uh, industrial robotics, and it turned out to be a success. Um, uh, had the largest attendees in the KSI Farms history. So um, hosting the event uh, uh, enabled Kawasaki to be better recognized in Silicon Valley um, to generate more opportunities. And also the event um, brought more attention to our efforts, particularly uh, in the areas of um, robotics and AI. Uh, so that's it. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. And here's my contact. I'll be happy to address any questions uh, from you guys. Thank you. Thank you, Christiana. And to make it clear for everyone, you're sent by Kawasaki on a business visa. And one of your responsibilities for Kawasaki doing business here is to uh, interact with us at the US Asia Center to do this study. Uh, I'd like to point out for everybody that you wrote about a 40 page paper. The report <laughs> yeah. you talked about was really master's thesis length on uh, open innovation. And yeah, so I'm impressed and also impressed that you're uh, getting into the Silicon Valley spirit of volunteering and being really part of the community. So mm -hmm. thanks, thanks very much. Uh, our next presentation is going to be by Mr. Hiro Nishinaka of Ishin Company. Hiro-san, Nishinaka-san, are you um, ready to go? Sure. Great. Yep. Hi, my name is Hiro Nishinaka. So I am working for a Japanese tech media company uh, called Ishin. So today, I would like to talk about the role of large Japanese enterprises in the Silicon Valley ecosystem from a media perspective. So this is the outline for my presentation. So first, I'm going to talk a little bit about us and my research activities at Stanford, and then I'll offer some guidance for large Japanese firms' innovation activities in the COVID-19 era. Yeah, first of all, so I would like to talk what Ishin does briefly. So as I mentioned it before, Ishin is a Japanese tech media firm. So, and our mission is to boost entrepreneurship and the startup ecosystem in Japan through the power of media. So we have been publishing a business magazine focusing on Japanese entrepreneur and the startups since 1999. So we distribute 25,000 copies in Japan, and we also host a startup conference in Tokyo and in Osaka every year. We also have a US branch um, in Menlo Park called Ishin USA. So we directly interview and introduce promising startups like Zoom, Slack, and also Silicon Valley Insiders through our media platform, TechBlitz. So our Tech Blitz audience is mainly large Japanese firms which are doing open innovation activities to accelerate their core business and explore new business opportunities to utilize the Silicon Valley ecosystem. So now we have 6,000 corporate subscribers and we are trying to bridge the gap between Japan and Silicon Valley through the media. So I am a founding member of Ishin USA. And also, I am here as a visiting scholar at Stanford to figure out some answers to the questions that I had by harnessing the Stanford network and then getting support from Dr. Dasher. So I have been trying to understand the role of large Japanese firms in the ecosystem. And also, I wanted to build connections between these firms and the Silicon Valley startups. So one of my output in this year at Stanford was to co-host Silicon Valley New Japan Summit with USA TMC. So I would like to say thank you uh, for helping us, you know, Dr. Dasher, uh, Kim, Mr. Kushida-san. 
So in this summit, so we highlighted large Japanese farms that are successfully building a presence within the Silicon Valley ecosystem. So there have been notable examples and one of the case studies shared in the summit was Komatsu. So Komatsu is the world leading heavy machinery producer, mainly dealing in the construction industry. So they re released the smart construction platform, which connects the entire construction process on the cloud. So they integrated the startup's drone data analytics technology into the platform to make construction safer and more productive. So this entire platform has been incorporated into over 9,200 job sites all over the world. And that San Francisco based drone data startup gained huge opportunity, huge business opportunities by collaborating with large Japanese firms. So this type of collaboration is one of good example for global open innovation and the role of large Japanese firms contributing to the startup ecosystem. So in our event, we also invited over 80 fast growing local startup to give them business development opportunities with 150 Japanese firms like Komatsu. So I realized that the interest of Silicon Valley startups in connecting with large Japanese firms has been growing stronger gradually. So, but now, so everything has been changing due to COVID-19 era, 19. So what should Japanese enterprises do with their innovation activities in this situation? So Mr. Kushida warns of Japanese firms' behavior patterns in downturns. So he mentioned that the Japanese enterprises attempt to enter Silicon Valley during the peak periods of bubble, then retreat as soon as the bubble bursts. So will it happen again? So do Japanese firms need to stop collaborating with startup because of the financial instability? So I just want to say, so now is the time to accelerate their innovation activities. So because, so history shows, so disruptive startup and innovation are born in downturns. So interestingly, over 100 unicorns were born around the last financial crisis. So Airbnb was born in 2008, and then also Uber was also in 2009. So these world-shaping business were born during a market disruption. So that's why so US large firms continue seeking opportunities to collaborate with startup now. So Target just acquired the same day delivery tech startup last week. Also Zoom acquired an end-to-end -end encryption startup. And then Zoom acquired that security startup just via Zoom meeting. So they have never met the CEO face to face so for M&A. So the US large firms are trying to solve their pain point and scale their business by open innovation activities, even in downturns. So again, what should Japanese enterprises do in this situation? So I would like to say now is the time to accelerate Japanese firms' innovation activities. So because startups are in emergency mode now and they need resources that they don't have in times like these. So they are looking for fundraising, fundraising, so user acquisition, global distribution partners, and they also demand the opportunities as well. So, but even Silicon Valley venture capitals tend to focus on their portfolio companies now. So Japanese firms can fill this gap. So you can gain trust when you help others in their hard time. So it leaves good reputation in this ecosystem, I guess. So through my research activities, so I can tell there have been notable examples of large Japanese firms like Komatsu successfully harnessing the Silicon Valley ecosystem in recent years. However, the number of Japanese insiders in this area is still small. So we need to continue like building robust networks. So lastly, it's good timing for large Japanese firms to enter the Silicon Valley ecosystem because this downturn has created gaps in funding and the support that these startups need to be filled. So thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Nishinaka-san. And it was really exciting to be able to partner with you and your colleagues to put on this big summit with more than 500 people and 80 companies involved. So uh, we're, very happy to see uh, your cooperation and look forward to working with you more in the future. Um, changing pace for a few minutes, we've had a number of presentations by our visiting scholars, but now I'd like to ask uh, for Dr. Kenji Kushida, who is a research fellow 
with the Asia Pacific Research Center at Stanford to uh, give us some comments and then Kenji and I will talk a little bit about how we see Japan developing over the next few years. It's been our privilege to cooperate with Kenji in a more active way just in the last couple of years and especially over the last year and last few months. Kenji has really involved us in a lot of the activities, his uh, research and also program activities. It's uh, been great to cooperate and look forward to doing even more uh, close cooperation in the future. Kenji, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Richard. So yeah, it's been wonderful to collaborate uh, much more deeply in the past couple of years, and I hope this is the beginning of uh, many good years to come. So a brief introduction. Basically, I live for linking Japan and Stanford together, Silicon Valley and Stanford, and the new and interesting parts of Japan. I do that through two sort of spearheads of scholarship. One is how technology is shaped by rules and regulations and how policy shapes those rules and regulations driven by politics. That's the scholar side one. And the second one is how Japan is really transforming, how the political economy is transforming. And the outcomes of these are expressed in many different activities that we do and a lot of publications. And Pretty much most of what I do here is a collaboration between uh, Richard and USATMC and uh, myself. So it's been my pleasure. I'm sharing slide screens. I hope you can see them. Yep. Looks good. So of course our highlight was, as Hiro just said, uh, the uh, Silicon Valley New Japan Summit. Uh, I have a higher number, 600 plus participants, because I include the uh, uh, Silicon Valley startups, which you had 80 plus uh, and multiple people for those, and then 150 Japanese uh, large companies. And this was the latest iteration. The focus of this is that the panelists are carefully selected for what they're doing that's new and interesting, and especially what we haven't heard before. Uh, so we're less interested in a sort of a company introduction of this is what uh, our structure is and more about this is what we're doing. Here are some results and it adds to the ecosystem of Silicon Valley by pointing out uh, good collaborations that are underway. And the second day of the summit is a real business matching where the Silicon Valley startups, B series or beyond, can meet with established Japanese companies who are looking for partnerships. And uh, uh, Hiro was very, uh, Nishinaka-san was very uh, uh, not bragging about this, so I will uh, say it on his behalf. They have produced a series of excellent articles uh, in their media uh, portfolio of the panels from uh, the summits. Uh, Richard was a moderator for a lot of them. Uh, I did some others. And more and more of these are published. And especially now during an era where things have slowed down a little bit with the uh, global pandemic, now is the time to study and learn from these examples uh, of how various large firms have engaged in open innovation and done concrete things because we've written about them. Also, uh, now is a good time to um, uh, do per, sort of human capital development. And the latest article from Mitsubishi uh, Corporation, uh, Suzuki Motors and uh, Kashima uh, Construction show how they're harnessing Silicon Valley to really uh, ramp up their human resources education. And so another big milestone this year was a major report in collaboration with the Bay Area Council Economic Institute and US ATMC. Uh, it's as far as I know, the, uh, for the past at least 20 years, uh, the biggest report, most comprehensive on Japan and the Bay Area and Silicon Valley, and the new chapter that we are in the various networks of relationships that we have. Uh, in the website of the Bay Area Council Economic Institute, I couldn't find anything that was really substantive and Japan focused since the inception of the uh, website 20 years ago. And so it's probably longer than that since something has been uh, published. And the audience for this one is Bay Area companies, Silicon Valley companies. The membership of this institute is the who's who of Silicon Valley. And so both the established ones and the newer ones. So to really get the message out for what the new wave of Japanese companies are doing to harness Silicon Valley. 
we, uh, with uh, various member companies who are members of USA TMC, we uh, run monthly Benkyokai study sessions. And here are some of the themes that we've talked about. Harnessing Silicon Valley, doing real uh, sharing of experiences uh, by large Japanese companies. Uh, I have a thought piece on 5G and value creation because there's some a misunderstanding that, of course, just building the networks will suddenly create value, but it's about who creates the value of using the networks uh, that can't do it in other ways, and the two things are separate. Others, data-driven decision-making seen through Netflix, a proof-of-concept workshop. Now is a good time to study how to do proof-of-concept for large firms because things have stalled uh, a bit, and so uh, finding the pain points and then potential solutions. We did a couple of those. Uh, last week we held one on Silicon Valley and China uh, because uh, of before and then an after. So we did the before snapshot because some of the people from large Japanese companies here are members. Uh, they were responsible for both the Silicon Valley and the China strategy uh, from a Japanese company and they're very closely related. So exploring some of those, and we got to hear updates of some of the new and fascinating services and developments in China to deal with the post or the during COVID-19 uh, situation that others may actually uh, mimic. We're also doing a post-pandemic future vision workshop. So we go through and look at various pain points that uh, are the way that we are living now and have experienced for the past months, real pain points that can be focused upon. And then what are potential solutions? Uh, because a lot of companies find that one of the functions they can do in harnessing Silicon Valley is this way of thinking of going through the pain points, really digging deep, and then coming up with potential solutions. Well, in order to make a future vision map, it's less about what you happen to have as a portfolio of what you can do, and more about what are the pain points and how can you solve those. So those are the types of workshops. I've also written a few uh, articles and media appearances about Silicon Valley in Japan. The Diamond Harvard Business View in Japan uh, takes up a few case studies of companies here. NPR about comments in Japan, uh, uh, here and there in Nikkei. Another thread of research right now uh, where Japan provides a big opportunity and it links it with Silicon Valley is Japan's aging society as an opportunity. How the extreme demographics are shaping some of the technological trajectories because uh, as we know, before COVID, extreme labor shortage uh, and full employment. So a lot of the robotics or AI solutions were not uh, leading to any kind of political backlash, which then created opportunities to measure things uh, and quite a bit of interest from Silicon Valley companies interested in uh, getting data from Japan to have solutions that could then, of course, address pain points in Japan, but globally. So there's a book chapter uh, forthcoming uh, in a few months uh, about this topic, and I've given a few talks about it. And finally, Abenomics Third Arrow and Japan's uh, Entrepreneurship and Innovation Ecosystem. Uh, the third arrow, of course, is structural reform. And there's actually a list of about 60 key performance indicators that have evolved over the past five years. Some have disappeared, some have been added, and a lot of uh, concrete reform measures. It's very unusual for key performance indicators to be a part of any real government strategy. And uh, the Abe administration is quite interesting for having done that. I evaluate that based on an understanding of the Silicon Valley ecosystem. Does this push some aspects of Japan more towards or further away from that? And I find that a lot of the support uh, is very positive, not all the uh, uh, various aspects of his administration are uh, universally praised, but this part is, I think, a big step forward compared to the past 20 years. So that's the activities overview, and I'm hoping that Richard and I can start with a conversation, uh, and I can kick that off with a, a few slides about Japan's emerging and maturing startup ecosystem, but I'll hand them Yeah, actually, you. Kenji, uh, I was hoping you would do that because instead of us just going into talking, thanks for the activities report, you had some really great points about needing to inject flexibility into sort of Japanese management structures and decision making. So let me ask you, if, if you've got those slides handy, please show them. That's great. Okay, great. Uh, thanks. Let's do that. Oops, sorry, that's the wrong one. Bear with me.
Okay, we are seeing your slide. During startup ecosystem. Yep. There we go. Great. So just a couple basic things for everybody that's studying Japan's startup ecosystem. Uh, and then looking at Silicon Valley too. Of course, Japan's uh, uh, economy was large firm, dominated in most of the post-war period. Startups are unlikely to replace the income but large Japanese firms because that's not what their role is. And of course, the startup ecosystem in Japan is tiny compared to Silicon Valley, just is every other startup ecosystem. We are interested in Japan's startup ecosystem mainly because a big challenge of Japan since the 1990s was the slow moving corporate adjustment to fast moving technological change and Silicon Valley firms driving the disruption. So Japan's startup ecosystem, I think, can be critical to injecting flexibility into Japan's political economy. That's the main role that it can play. Uh, new actors and traditional firms can harness each other's strengths. There are advantages to being startups, but there are also real advantages towards being big firms. So that's uh, where this whole investigation starts. This is, by the way, I should say, is a man book manuscript underway. It'll be done fairly soon. I keep saying that, which means that it will be soon because enough people will keep asking me about it. So it's going beyond simply let's copy Silicon Valley. I'm not saying they should try to emulate Silicon Valley as an entire system or re build regional pockets of insert name Silicon Valley. Uh, these kinds of things generally don't work very well because Silicon Valley has a specific history. Silicon Valley also has massive social problems. We should not ignore that, including inequality and a gender disparity. However, there's still real value in bolstering Japan's startup ecosystem because there's a lot to uh, learn how the Silicon Valley ecosystem, the elements complement each other. And there's lots of room for good government policy to strengthen the underlying institutions in Japan that support the ecosystem part of it. So we're not trying to replace the court, we're trying to augment it. And uh, so a quick review of the Silicon Valley model, the financial system is venture capital, labor market is fluid at all levels in all directions with a global draw. The industry university government ties are multifaceted and multi-directional and extremely deep. And we're an example of this relationship between large firms and small firms, open innovation symbiosis. Uh, and we've talked about this in our great keynote today. And this is a large reason why uh, you're working with us. Social systems, uh, entrepreneurs are celebrated and supported. And also for failure, it's a monitoring and evaluation of failure so that if you fail in a good way, it can actually uh, help your next step. And if you fail in a bad way, that's also evaluated and you don't have second and third chances. So it's different from being sort of uh, easy on failure. And there's a very developed professional services ecosystem. So uh, we don't need to go through all of this, but Japan in the mid 90s, uh, across all these institutions in the left hand column, you can see that they were impediments. The Japanese system had a lot of impediments towards growing a a robust startup ecosystem. However, after a lot of regulatory changes driven by politics of the 90s and 2000s, big changes now facilitate the startup ecosystem. New small cap financial markets, increasing labor mobility in certain areas, uh, and universities have been reformed. There's a more successful spin out. There's a focus on it. Government provides legitimacy. They even have some KPIs. Firms are more interested in open innovation, uh, attractiveness of entrepreneurship, and uh, the sort of flip side of the coin of less attractive to be in a big firm with a lifetime career and government. And the ecosystem of professional services is developing rapidly. So the next slide, which is the last one I'll show you, is the crux of my argument here, which is that we're seeing an emergence of multiple logics. The traditional Japanese model, if you look at it, is alive and well and all of these interlocking aspects are still there. At the same time, in parallel to it and symbiotic to it, we see the emerging and maturing startup ecosystem with all of these aspects. So uh, that's sort of the primer for our discussion and I'll hand that back to Richard. So Kenji, uh, I look forward to seeing that come out as a book chapter. That will be fascinating. Uh, I remember back in the, around the 2000 downturn, the dot-com crash, where we were getting all of these, uh, you know, the message that would come to me time and again from Japan was, well, is this the end of Silicon Valley? And it's been kind of interesting because this time I'm not hearing, is this the end of Silicon Valley? Uh, I'm, uh, on the one hand, I think that that indicates 
sort of a deeper understanding of what's going on in Japan, maybe more of the kind of, you know, building up of the Japanese startup ecosystem. But I'd like to ask you, what do you think is the hardest thing for Japanese people to understand about Silicon Valley, the Silicon Valley model? Well, oh, that's a great question. And um, so, so one of the uh, articles that uh, Ishin has kindly um, published uh, goes into uh, the 10 worst practices of large Japanese companies in trying to harness Silicon Valley. Best practices are what consultants will try to, uh, well, uh, some successfully will try to address. And I believe that uh, for harnessing Silicon Valley, there aren't really best practices because each firm brings different things. There are worst practices. Uh, and these things don't work. And so to pick a couple of those, uh, I think, the interlocking nature of the various component aspects of Silicon Valley are that make it a whole ecosystem, make it very difficult. So you can go and talk to a startup and start a relationship with the startup, but then the founder moves and you might be better off following what the founder does next rather than the corporate to corporate relationship. Uh, I'm more interested in following Elon Musk from uh, PayPal to Tesla, then I am PayPal after Elon Musk leaves. This kind of logic where it's a person and it, and so, uh, and then if you're talking to VCs, venture capitalists, then the question is, uh, who are they investing in and how do they shift who they're investing in, in when they start to see the fast growth areas? Because 90 some percent of their investments don't work out. So just following who they invest in as a corporate follow on CBC follow on may not be the best strategy. It's where they adjust to. So all these aspects fitting together uh, are usually not understood. And that's what we're working on. But and, and so with the downturn, sorry, uh, uh, the fundamentals of the ecosystem I think the fundamentals are, are, are there and it's stable. A lot of good firms will go by the wayside, but finding the pain points, looking for scale uh, and taking the vast human resource pool that's sort of opened up as some good companies fail, I think that will continue. And so people who are in the know seem to see that. Now you're speaking primarily about people on the Japan side and their kind of management system. In understanding Silicon Valley, yeah. Yeah, and okay. So the um, Silicon Valley. What do you think are the things that we need to help the people who are assigned here from Japan about? What are the things that they need the most? I think uh, one of our important roles uh, is we, we keep seeing this pattern of uh, people on three-year terms or shorter come to Silicon Valley from a large company. They learn. They study very hard and they learn. They make a lot of friends, uh, do some business, and then their time is up and they're shifted to the next rotation. Uh, and then the next person comes, but they don't have the same uh, human network resources. And all of the things that they send to headquarters from Silicon Valley go in a corporate hierarchy up. And so people high up don't necessarily take uh, that to heart the way they would if, say, an external entity says something that's fairly similar. And so part of our uh, providing cover, and in Japanese it's engo shageki, right? So um, uh, we will amplify your message. We understand it. And to different parts of the company that the company structure doesn't let necessarily the information flow. I think we can play a great role in that, as well as education about how it works here. Oops, you're muted, sorry. Muted. Thanks, Kenji. I'm afraid that to keep things moving along, I'm gonna have to stop our conversation here, but I really appreciate your comments. Uh, it makes me realize that we're all trying to create new value in one way or another, and that really is the essence of innovation. So right now, we have gotten down to our last set of visiting scholar reports. We will start with uh, Mr. Kenji Niwa of uh, Niwa Capital. So, Niwa-san, are you online? Yes, I'm here. Okay. 
um, if you would tell us a little bit about what you've been doing. Oh, yes. Uh, now uh, I'm uh, trying to start my own fintech startup uh, in the Bay Area. And uh, I have a meeting with Dr. Dasha weekly. So it's very helpful to uh, understand the uh, fintech market uh, in the United States. So, yeah. And uh, before that, uh, I was uh, uh, researching about uh, Silicon Valley e ecosystem uh, as uh, uh, because I was entrepreneur in Japan and uh, now I'm investing in uh, US startup. So I have to understand uh, differences uh, about uh, between e US and Japanese ecosystem. And yeah, it was a very exciting uh, experience uh, to discuss about the topic with Dr. Dashek. Yeah. Well, that's, that's very that's kind nice. of you to say. Um, this is kind of a difficult time to be thinking about starting up a company. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yes, absolutely. In some aspects. Uh, but in my opinion, there are a lot of uh, great opportunities uh, for startup people or because uh, like an industry uh, uh, like a situation uh, is uh, uh, drastically uh, changed. Like, a, uh, for example, e-commerce or like a SaaS companies, revenue is going up. Uh, I see a lot of earnings uh, of the uh, public companies, public startup companies earning and their revenue is like a skyrocket. So we have uh, absolutely uh, great opportunities. So uh, I haven't, I haven't introduced you to everybody, but um, Niwa Capital are really funds that you created because of taking a startup company, creating, founding a startup company while you were still a student in Japan, and taking it uh, all, all the way to exit through acquisition in Japan. Yeah. Uh, if you had seen Silicon Valley back mm -hmm. when you started your company in Japan, would you have done anything different? Uh, so what do you mean? So if I start in... Uh, yeah, start if, you, if you knew back then mm -hmm. what you know now about Silicon Valley, what would you have done different about your company? Oh... Mm, yeah, <laughs> in my previous company, I uh, ran my own startup, uh, Bootstrap. I didn't raise equity at all. So that was, uh, of course, uh, there is a good aspect and bad aspect. I, I can control uh, my exit completely without uh, consulting shareholders because I don't have shareholders. But um, on the other hand, I couldn't, uh, like, uh, I have to keep my company profitable. So I couldn't uh, invest uh, a lot of money in my businesses. So that's a, a one problem. So if I knew the, like, a startup scene well, I I were, I, I would raise the money in the past. Okay, thanks. And actually, uh, is there anything else that you would like to tell uh, the audience here today in regard to um, things you've learned about Silicon Valley? Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I felt at first, Silicon Valley is, a, uh, in terms of size, uh, completely different from Japanese one. So, yeah, some people try to make Silicon Valley in Japan. Actually, all over the world, people, in, even in Germany, 
or UK or a lot of people try to make Silicon Valley in each country, but in my opinion, it's not easy uh, because uh, the country is different. America is a different country from other uh, developed country because, uh, yeah, uh, English speaking countries and uh, there is a already super big market in the uni United States. So if you uh, win in the US, uh, you can easily expand to English country uh, like a UK and the US and Australia very easily. And then uh, you, you can go to the uh, Europe and Japan and Asia uh, because there is a lot of uh, great talent, uh, diverse talent in the Silicon Valley. So yeah, if Japan uh, make Silicon Valley in uh, Japanese government want to make Silicon Valley in Japan, we need to change Japan at first, in my opinion. I keep doing this while I'm muted. Miwa-san, thank you very much for your comments. Uh, we'll keep things going and we'd like to move on to uh, Mr. Yasuhito Ando, who is uh, representing KKE Incorporated, Kozo Keikaku Engineering. Ando-san, the, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Yeah, can you see? Yes. Okay. Our, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Yasuhito Ando. Uh, I'm from Kozo Keikaku Engineering Inc. Uh, this is my second year as a visiting scholar at Stanford University. Today, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, this year's my research. Uh, here is the table of contents. First of all, uh, let me explain about my company. Uh, our company was founded in 1959 as a university launched venture firm. So uh, the current size of the company is now over 600 people. And uh, uh, we are uh, an independent company. Our company has many business fields, uh, construction, uh, information, telecommunication, and manufacturing, and uh, decision-making support. Uh, every field is based on simulation technology. And uh, uh, these are the result of expanding into a new business area every 20 years. Today, uh, we use uh, that simulation technology to provide human and uh, social consulting service. Now, uh, we need to find a business for the next 20 years. Uh, my specialty is uh, architecture. Uh, however, uh, I've worked in a wide range of uh, department example, uh, corporate planning and uh, human resources. I think uh, that my strengths. Yeah. This, is, uh, this year's activities, uh, as a social trends, uh, digital transformation is underway in many industries. Since our company's uh, business and my background, uh, I focused on creating new uh, special value for the facility management and the construction industries. I collaborated on this research with Tamaki-san. Uh, he is a, a graduate student at Stanford University. Uh, by 
uh, engaging him as a research assistant, uh, KKE will also be supporting USATMC. The survey is processed by uh, turning the following cycle. First, uh, we need to set some keywords and uh, use that keyword in many, many websites to create a list of startup. From there, we do more in-depth research on some of the startup. For each validation item, use the suitable search sites or database. The findings are reviewed each week with Professor Dasher. And by the uh, review, we get tips and the next steps, then uh, run the cycles. We actually uh, listed over 200 companies and uh, selected about 10 of them for depth research. Uh, through this research, uh, I found several startups and uh, have referred them to my company. Uh, I'd like to share two startups. Uh, they are very interested. Uh, Sotwire uh, offers a smart hospital solution. Uh, they are adding uh, medical staff attributes and uh, location information and uh, patient guidance and uh, uh, emergency predictions to um, facility management. Uh, Urban Well uh, takes into account the, uh, the air quality and the weather in your office to provide a happy working space. The common point of the uh, two solutions is engagement with people. Uh, this is my finding. First of all, uh, it is important to be clear about what social issues you will be focusing on. Focusing on. Uh, sometimes uh, it's necessary to come back to the point of origin. And next, uh, there are many startup databases. However, that is uh, not always true. Uh, startups are changing every day. So uh, take a look at the news release, the amount of funding and sales, and the number of employees. And uh, uh, we guess what's going on with that company. Uh, the information on a company's website is op uh, optimized for search engine. The true business is hidden. I hope uh, that this experience will create one way to develop new business in our company. Okay, Ando-san, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry, I, I thought that was your oh, image. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, fine. Uh, it is said that the future of so uh, society, the after corona or the with corona, uh, there are going to be a, a major changes in our lives. I think uh, we need a new working experience and the services. Uh, the photo below is of an uh, office building called the DH in Amsterdam. Uh, this building is known as the most intelligent uh, building in the world. Uh, I'm hoping uh, that this building will give me hints as to what the uh, future space should be. Yeah, this ends uh, my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Andosan. And, uh, you know, I look forward to continuing to work with KKE and to see how we can uh, continue to help, uh, you know, look at these sort of industry transformation topics. Our uh, next presentation is going to be by um, 
if you would stop sharing, great. Yeah. Our next presentation is by Mr. Yoshito Tadada, who is with Hamamatsu Iwata Shinkin Bank. Tadada-san, the floor is yours. Can't hear you. You're muted. I think you're muted. Mm. Okay. okay, sorry. Now I hear you. Great. Uh, can you show me through it? Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Yosto Terada, USAT MC Visiting Scholar from Hamamatsu Yoto Shinkin Bank. Uh, it's a great honor to be invited here, and thank you to Dr. Dasha for holding a meeting every week. Today, I'm going to cover three points. First, our business area in Japan, and the second, about our company, and lastly, report on my activities of this fiscal year. I have joined in this use SATMC corporate affiliate program since July last year, but I've been staying in Japan temporarily since last March due to the influence of COVID-19. Okay, let's move on. First topic, our business area in Japan. Uh, that is very unique and important for us. Our business area is mainly Hamamatsu City and Iwata City, located around the west side of Shizuoka Prefecture, center of Japan. As you know, Hatano-san from Shizuoka Prefectural Government Office belongs to APAC of Stanford University. Our bank is not a bank, you imagine, like uh, MUFG, SMBC, or SBI. We call those banks mega bank or net bank. In contrast, we have a very small and limited business area and target specific customers. For that reason, our bank is small. Our world ranking is 679th in the world. For comparison, Silicon Valley Bank is 234th in the world, but only bank size is not an important for us. Now, I will briefly explain about Hamamatsu City. Our head office is located. Hamamatsu City is surrounded by the Pacific Ocean in the south and the mountains in the north. Global car makers Honda and Suzuki Motor were established in Hamamatsu City and the founder of Toyota Motors were also, ah, sorry, uh, Toyota Motors, ah, a founder of Toyota Motors was also born and uh, raised in the neighborhood city. Actually, the motorcycle industry was thriving in the past, but now the automobile manufacturing industry is growing as the main industry of our hometown. It's also famous for mus musical instruments industry. Yamaha, Kawai, and Roland are located their headquarters in Hamamatsu. In recent years, a unique company called Hamamatsu Photonics has been an important role in the optical industry in the world. Now, let me explain a little about the role of Shinkin Bank. Our company is regional bank. Our business area, area is restricted by law. Therefore, we can only do business is 
a very small business area, which is equal to our hometown. Credit unions in the US are said to be similar to Japanese Shinkin banks. Another characteristic is that Shinkin banks specialize in local small businesses and medium sized enterprises. Therefore, we are called home doctor as a SME is. Moving on the third topic about my activities at Stanford. At first, to run ecosystem in Silicon Valley through our networks. I could use our company networks in the Bay Area, our bank invested as a limited partner to DNX Ventures and Sozo Ventures to collect latest information about emerging trends and startups in Bay Area. And also our bank joined JCCNC to collaborate with Japanese companies operating by in Bay Area. As I expected, uh, this membership brought us many information, especially human networks. Next, my mission is to run with first-hand observation. I had a chance to attend the, the official visit from Japan to the Bay Area, which is especially related to our hometown. In particular, it reminds me to attend the official meeting between Iwata City, where I live in, now in Japan, uh, with the mayor of Mountain View City. I live in the US now. It was a great pleasure for me and the memorial to think of administration policy in the Bay Area. My mission three is, uh, this is a photo that was for the business meeting with Dr. Dasha between our director from Japan. We discussed digital transformation or FinTech from a banking perspective and the corporate innovation method. It's a great meeting for us. And I was able to narrow down my research theme from at that time. And next, my mission is to learn about emerging industries that are relevant Hamamatsu industry. I have a chance to join industrial some trade fairs in California because our customers have exhibited at those trade fair to seek their opportunities for business in the US. As a conclusion, I have learned and understood Disruptive innovations change the world's industrial structure. Novel coronavirus could significantly change Silicon Valley startups. I think this will have present cons affects Japan, also our hometown. And I'd like to study next year impact of working from home on world society and emerging industries like a plant-based meat, sharing subscription businesses. Okay, thank you for listening and I hope I'll be back very area soon. Thank you, Dr. Dasha. Adada-san, thank you. We hope you'll be able to be back here physically soon too. Uh, we at the US Asia Technology Management Center on occasion are able to ask uh, special people to be visiting scholars that would normally not fit into our regular profile. 
in the past, we've had people associated with us like the person who developed DRAM technologies in Hitachi. We've had uh, Dr. Norm Winarski, who was the head of commercialization for the Stanford Research Institute back in the days when they spun off what is now Siri and Apple. And uh, for the last few months, we've been able to work with Dr. Amit Kapoor. And Dr. Kapoor is the CEO of the India Council on Competitiveness. He's the chair of the Institute for Competitiveness in India. He is chair of the prize committee for the Porter Prize. Uh, he's lectured at Harvard Business School and other top business schools. He's given lectures for us a number of times. And so for our final visiting scholar presentation today, I'm delighted that Dr. Kapoor, who had to go back to India because he's close to uh, advising the prime minister. Uh, so as soon as the COVID-19 breakout started, he was pulled back and we've been able to uh, have a lot of Zoom meetings since then. But Amit, thanks very much for getting up early in the morning to talk to us this morning. Um, yeah, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, thank you, Richard, for the kind words. I, I'm absolutely, uh, I, I'm stunned actually for, by your introduction. Uh, but fairly quickly, uh, jumping into uh, the conversation, uh, you know, like um, I must say that this, these have been the most fascinating five months for me uh, from a learning point of view. Uh, if you really ask me, like uh, the last five months since I've actually been associated with uh, Stanford and especially with Richard, uh, I've had the most stunning set of conversations on aspects which are uh, ranging from philosophy to the idea of God, to the idea of industry, to innovation, to populism, to capitalism, and so on and so forth. And I think all these ideas, if you really look at it, have, have been something which I've been thinking of or about for a long time. But I think there was a sounding board in Richard who, who just enabled me to hone some of my ideas. And and now there is an outcome which I'm actually seeing. And of course, that there is a concretization of some level of work that I was actually doing as well. Uh, so that those, those things are happening. Uh, and then of course, the whole idea of coming to Stanford or spending time was to really see as to what kind of ecosystem that exists in that part of the world, because it has actually been one of the biggest centers for development of uh, entrepreneurship, wealth creation, uh, and of course, its own challenges within the Bay Area. And when we really talk about in a context like India, the question is, it, can we replicate the success of Bay Area? What has been the reason for that? So what, what creates that whole ecosystem? What creates the cluster? Uh, is it a governmental intervention? If it is a governmental intervention, then what kind of intervention needs to be done? If there are institutions for collaboration, what kind of institutions for collaboration uh, need to happen? And of course, uh, I must also say that I've, I've had very interesting opinions about how U.S. functions, uh, but this is for the first time I've actually started looking at things from a very different lens as I was spending more and more time uh, at Stanford. And of course, unfortunately, because of the COVID crisis, uh, all of us really started moving back to our respective locations. But uh, there, there was something that from a vantage point when I was actually there uh, at Stanford, I really did start getting a lot of interesting insights. And I, I kind of started changing my opinion in many interesting ways about how, uh, what do you call how U.S. functions and things, positive and negative as well. I, I must say, a uh, lot of positives, but a lot of negative uh, things that happen within the country. And I think Richard and I had some amazing discussions on it, uh, from like my absolute surprise for uh, dislike of people like Abraham Lincoln in the U.S. Uh, for for me, like. I always, I was telling Richard, you know, like if there is one person I would like to meet in history, it has to be Abraham Lincoln because the way he transformed the world for us, uh, there has not been a single person who had that wherewithal to look at those things. You, you might disagree with me, but uh, for me, he's the uh, person who, who created the society that we look at in many, many ways. And then of course, uh, if you really ask me as to, for the activities, uh, for the last few months, uh, in fact, I do a column every uh, week, but then there has been a fascinating set of conversations that Richard and I have actually had. And we have published one article and I'm already anticipating three or four more to happen uh, with the popular media. And uh, uh, in fact, uh, 
if you really look at the uh, depth of uh, conversations, one of them we were, one of the articles that has been published is like how we are really seeing a new economic order emerging. Uh, and we are really going to be talking about uh, newer ideas in terms of populism. We are talking about global supply chains. You're talking about changing consumer behavior uh, and things. So I am looking at those uh, articles coming through. Uh, but then I also must share that uh, Richard has been an amazing person in terms of really uh, giving me uh, a location to speak or place to speak. So when I started talking about the whole idea of democracy, uh, I do not know if Richard would uh, recollect or not. Uh, it was possibly 2013 when I actually had a conversation with him when he invited me for the first time. I think it was 2013 or 14. Uh, so that conversation, we had some brief interaction on democracies and everything, and I started thinking about it. And this is where my new book is, which is getting launched uh, very, very soon. In fact, uh, this whole book looks after as to how democracies are changing across the world. And then uh, if you really look at it, so some it's a book which is very, very different. It's, it's a set of pictures. It's a set of graphs. It's, it's a set of about 200 graph. So it's actually a pictorial book that I've actually created in terms of understanding as to how democracies are changing, what it means. And I've looked at countries across the world, which includes India, US, Brazil, and United Kingdom. And these are the countries which have actually seen a lot of change uh, in the last uh, few years. And uh, right or wrong, I think uh, there is some stunning change that's happening within the United States. There is some huge change that's happening within India. Uh, so if you really look at it, like these are some of the ideas that are coming through from the book uh, and how I see how, how democracy is changing, like what are full democracies, in fact, or what are the kind of flawed democracies? What I see is that how U.S. is moving towards being a flawed democracy uh, rather than uh, something which used to be at the epitome of the system in terms like, of a country which created democracy, which I already see signs of a flawed democracy happening or make America great again. Uh, in fact, these are the, some of the uh, out, uh, what you call insights that we are gonna come through. But quite interestingly, uh, this also leads us to some very interesting insights on the disparity that actually exists in the uh, world. And the disparity in terms of, there were 17 states and unemployment was uh, what you call, where Trump actually did win quite a bit. Uh, but then uh, if you really look at it, unemployment had actually risen out there. So there is a question of disparity in things. If you look at Britain as well, so these are very interesting correlations. Uh, people who were doing well and people who were actually qualified, they wanted to remain, um, but then there was some kind of a linkage between education and how people were looking at Britain. So these are some insights again. Uh, on income gains, like this is again about disparity. US is going through it, the world is going through it. So these sets of insights, which I'm actually seeing. Uh, but then very quickly, uh, I just started doing a book, and this is again a very, very interesting one. And uh, Richard and I have been talking about it. Like, we had a first conversation on this just last week, but I think he just put me into a very interesting direction, uh, which I would have not realized. But then uh, it was about, uh, it, it is actually about history of writing instruments and economic development from an India point of view. So, my whole love for understanding history and as to how things change. So, my previous book was on economic history of India. So, this is more about how reading instruments and uh, what you call writing and economic development have actually gone hand in hand. So this book should be out uh, sometime soon. In fact, I'm writing it with the prime minister's economic advisor. And so our, uh, both our uh, what you call love for uh, things is just uh, love for history is just amazing. The next thing that I'm working on uh, is actually on innovation, and, and of course working with uh, Richard on the idea of possibly creating an index for something like the Silicon Valley ideas in India. So we are exploring all this, uh, but something on innovation and competitiveness uh, that we are looking at. Competitiveness from a viewpoint. I, I come from that point in terms of saying as to how India can be more competitive at various locations. Uh, and it is it has to go beyond the zero-sum game. And I think the whole conversation that which actually creates a lot of annoyance in the mind is that people think that, that uh, competitiveness is about zero-sum game, and the top leaders do think that uh, across the world. It is not about it. It is actually about that we can grow the pie. Uh, and I, I just hope uh, we can actually look at the way that capitalism can actually change in the future, because that's one debate. 
and that we are seeing the disparity and the challenges and the whole rise of population uh, populism is actually a reflection of how capitalism has gone wrong. So this is another book, another set of essays that I'm actually looking at. But at the end of the day, you might say, what is it that I'm trying to do talking about so many things from competitiveness, from geography and whatever. I think there is something called a theory of everything in business. Like everything is so very well interconnected. So if we are able to create the theory of everything and understand it but from a philosophical viewpoint, uh, which is far deep and far huge. But at the end of the day, I would just love to do something. Like if you really ask me one more thing that I would love to do, I would probably love to create a course on competitiveness, capitalism, uh, and philosophy. And uh, I hope uh, I'm able to offer that course at Stanford with Richard in uh, the next few months if uh, everything works out well. And so some, some brief ideas from my side. And thanks a lot, uh, Richard, for uh, enabling my a visit to Stanford. In fact, this visit actually got fructified over a conversation that we actually had when we were walking towards a car last year. Uh, and that, that's where it is. But thanks a lot for having me here. And it's just been a privilege uh, to really work with you. Thank you. Well, thanks for sharing with us what you're interested in and what you're working on. Uh, it kind of shows the, that when you're in this business of running a research center at Stanford, you can't sell just what you've been doing. You have to look at new possibilities and how we can approach these new possibilities. You know, and, and what you're talking about, think about the limits of democracy and the limits of capitalism. We'll, we'll have more of a discussion offline and see what we can do and see about putting this course together. Uh, I'm afraid that we're about out of time for today and uh, so what I want to do is to end with um, our contact information for anyone who is watching who would like further information about our center, who would like contacts with any of our speakers today, uh, or who would like to uh, make a suggestion to us about what we should look at in the future. We are in a very difficult time, but uh, as one of our presenters mentioned, a lot of unicorns came out of the 2007 to 2009 difficult time. And uh, we can move forward. Silicon Valley has one other cultural aspect and that is it's always a glass half full kind of place and we're going to look for new opportunities. But it is a serious context, a difficult context with security issues, with um, social issues that really must be considered more uh, as people try to create new value, not just for themselves, but for society as a whole. So I want to thank everyone for uh, participating today. want to thank uh, all of our panelists. Uh, I look forward to talking to you again very soon. And uh, thanks to the uh, people who have uh, been with us throughout the day uh, to watch the session. I'll call an end to our program at this point and uh, we look forward to uh, moving forward from here. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.